Thank you, Chair. You're right to go. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the virtual hearing for the inquiry into budget estimates 2021-22, the first in the New South Wales Parliament's history, fully virtual. Uh, before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which Parliament sits. I'd like to pay respects to the Elders past, present and emerging of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginals viewing this broadcast. Today, the committee will examine the proposed expenditure for the portfolio of Premier. Today's hearing is being conducted as a fully virtual hearing, which enables the work of the committee to continue during the COVID-19 pandemic without compromising the health and safety of members, witnesses and staff. As we break new ground with the technology, uh, I'd ask for everyone's patience uh, through any te technical difficulties we may encounter today. If participants lose their internet connection and are disconnected from the virtual hearing, they are asked to rejoin the hearing using the same link as provided by the committee secretariat. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. There may be some questions that witnesses could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide the answer within 21 days. All witnesses in budget estimates have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. Today's proceedings are broadcast live from Parliament's YouTube channel and a transcript will be placed on the committee's website once it becomes available. Finally, a few notes on virtual hearing etiquette to minimise disruptions and assist our Hansard reporters. Can I ask committee members to clearly identify who questions are directed to and could I ask everyone to please state their name when they begin speaking? Could everyone please mute their microphones when they're not speaking? Please remember to turn your microphones back on when you're getting ready to speak. If you start speaking while muted, please start your question or answer again so that we can get the record uh, accurately for the transcript. Members and witnesses should avoid speaking over each other so that we can all be heard clearly. Uh, also to assist Hansard, may I remind members and witnesses to speak directly into the microphone and avoid making comments when your head is turned away from the microphone. All witnesses will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Uh, first up, we will start uh, with uh, Mr Reardon. Uh, Mr. Ridden, if you could please state your full name and position title and then swear either an oath or affirmation from the cards that have been emailed to you by the Secretariat. Jim Ridden, Secretary, New South Wales Premier and Cabinet. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Boyd, could you please state your full name and position title and swear either an oath or affirmation? Catherine Boyd, Deputy Secretary and General Counsel, New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thanks to both of you. So today's hearing will be conducted from 9.30 to 11.30 uh, and then from 11.45 to 12.45 with questions from opposition and crossbench members only. Um, if required, an additional 15 minutes is allocated at the end of the hearing for government questions. Uh, there's no provision for any witnesses to make an opening statement before the committee begins questioning. So we will begin with questions from the opposition. Daniel, we can't hear you on mute. We'll just give you a second while you saw that. I think he's logged out and logging back in. We'll just give him a second.
Tara, I'm not sure where Daniel is. I I can start. Yeah. Oh, hang, on. hang on, here he is. I could just try this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, good morning to Mr. Ian and Ms. Boyd, and uh, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. And for being with us. Firstly, can I just convey um, through you, Mr. Ian, to my uh, public service thanks for the service that you have right now. So, Sorry, very quiet. We can't, there's noise at least, but we can't really hear what you're saying. Um, That's okay. Good. Sorry, I'll just have to rejoin from another opportunity. To... No, no, that's much better. Hey, where, whatever you're doing now is working. Okay. Um, well, I was just saying thank you, Mr. Eden, for your appearance this morning and to you, Ms. Boyd, as well. And uh, equally through you, Mr. Eden, for the entire New South Public Service, thank you for the work that has been performed right now in all this process. Uh, I was going to start by just asking some questions about government decision making processes, if that's okay, if you're in a position to help us explain. Um, I think we can infer that the crisis cabinet is currently responsible for taking all major policy decisions on behalf of the New South Wales government. I was hoping you'd be able to start by just explaining to us what exactly is the stop of its authority and does it have a terms of reference? I'm not sure if I got all of that, um, Mr. Mugi, but I'll uh, try my best. Um, I think your question was crisis cabinet and uh, does it have a terms of reference? Um, am I correct? Yes, and the scope of its authority. The source of its authority? Scope. Scope. Okay, okay. Um, so the New South Wales government has a full cabinet, as you're aware, and it has cabinet committees as uh, the Premier sees fit to prepare. Uh, one of those committees is a crisis uh, policy committee. Um, that crisis policy committee is outlined in terms of its... Um, functions uh, within the emergency management framework for the state of New South Wales. It is stood up when there is a uh, counter-terrorism incident, it is stood up when there's a pandemic, when there's a flood, when there's bushfires and a whole range of other um, crises as the Premier of the Day sees fit. Um, the responses and the disaster recovery plans and sub-plans are actually um, publicly available. I think they've been the same since about 2016. And within the, those sub-plans, it outlines that there is a crisis policy committee. Depending on the area of government or the area of a, a crisis, different membership may come into the crisis cabinet uh, group as the Premier sees fit. For example, the counter-terrorism uh, combat agency would be the New South Wales Police's lead. For a uh, bushfire, the Rural Fire Service would be the combat agency lead. And equally, you would set up the State Emergency Operations Centre to support um, uh, tasking and um, uh, the actual delivery of uh, government's uh, decisions. So the Crisis Policy Committee of Cabinet, uh, therefore, is outlined, as I say, in those sub-plans, uh, both its membership, which can change from time to time as the Premier sees fit, and, um, and its scope is... Uh, uh, is outlined in those documents as well um, and can furnish those documents um, uh, to you if you need them. Thank you, Mr. Reed, that would be helpful. Um, but given that you've somewhat preempted the question, I'll just go straight to it. Which ministers are currently the standing members of that committee for the purposes of managing this particular crisis? So uh, I'll just have to repeat because your microphone is a little bit difficult. You're asking me which me ministers are members of Crisis Policy Committee at this point in time? Yes, standing members. Uh, look, I'm not sure if the term standing members is appropriate because the Premier can ask for uh, who she sees fit, both ministerial membership and uh, senior public service membership uh, or attendance at that meeting, and that may change from time to time. So I don't think uh, you could coin it as a standing membership. Clearly, the Premier is there. Who are then the regular attendees? Uh, the regular attendees I was about to go through, the Premier, the Minister for Health, the Minister for Customer Service, um, the Deputy Premier, the Treasurer, and uh, there can be other attendees from time to time. And do you advise the, the Premier to adopt those members, or has that been a choice of the Premier's? I advise the Premier on many things, but not on membership of her Cabinet or her committees. 
Right. And is there a particular reason why uh, the police minister isn't a regular attendee of the meeting that you're aware of? It would be a matter for the Premier to answer that one. And equally, is there a reason why the Education Minister isn't a member, or has that also been a choice of the Premiers? Yeah, so, choice of the Premiers, but uh, Mr Mookie, there is attendance from other Ministers from time to time, which has occurred over the last, um, let me just be clear, uh, about 20 months, uh, just leading from bushfires then into COVID at the start of 2020. There has been a range of ministers who have um, attended crisis policy committee from time to time, a broad range. So are you able to shed any light on the media reports that have emerged about major decisions being made about the police orders and the police's authority and the police's recommendations without the attendance of the police minister at that forum? I don't speculate on media reports, and if you have a question about the decision-making within a cabinet setting, you have to put it to the Premier. Sure. It was uh, the Secretary of Premier and Cabinet. Uh, is the police minister attending all meetings in which police orders are being discussed? I'm not going to speculate on what goes on in those cabinet settings, and you'll have to put it to the Premier. Thank you. Um, equally, are you in a position to shed light as to whether or not the Education Minister is attending all meetings in which major education policy discussions and decisions are being made? I'll repeat my evidence I just gave you, which is from time to time, various ministers on various matters that may relate to their cluster will uh, attend crisis policy committee. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Can I ask, can you take us through which public servants are attending the crisis cabinet? It varies from time to time, but, um, and it is, uh, you know, it depends on the nature of uh, issues of the day, but um, uh, the Secretaries of the clusters um, I outlined previously, so Health, Premier and Cabinet, Deputy Premier, uh, being Regional New South Wales, uh, Secretary, Customer Service, and uh, the Treasury Secretary um, uh, are frequent attenders, but, um, attendees, but others can attend from time to time, Chief Health Officer and um, uh, the Commissioner of Resilience, New South Wales. Why is the Commissioner but, again, but, again, but again, they can change from time to time. Just be clear, do you invite them or does the Premier? The Premier invites them. I don't have jurisdiction to invite people to a Premier's uh, Cabinet Committee. Right. So why is it the, the head of Resilience New South Wales a regular attendee? The Commissioner of Resilience New South Wales is charged with two tasks um, in his role. One is uh, to look at preparedness for crises, all manner of crises. Uh, so he looks at uh, the future and what we can do and what we can do better, what we can learn lessons from, whether they're bushfires, floods, pandemic or anything else. And secondly, starts working on recovery. So uh, and tell me you, want, you want both the combat agency who is leading the response and you also want recovery. Same as for bushfires, you basically have the combat agency being the rural fire service supported by a state emergency operations coordinator to task response across government and then you also very quickly wanted to get onto recovery and one of the things i've learned over the last few years is um, the need for a more consistent formalized recovery agency and we established Re uh, resilience new south wales to do just that so we actually got onto recovery activity a lot faster so for example from about march last year to june last year uh, led by the Deputy Premier and supported by Resilience New South Wales, we did the massive clean-up of properties through uh, following the bushfire, even though COVID had struck. And if we didn't have an agency dedicated to that task, we probably wouldn't have moved at speed, led by the Deputy Premier at the time, to actually achieve quite a significant clean-up. So is the head of the Education Department a regular attendee of the meetings? Uh, look, the, the, ed, the Education Secretary will attend uh, from time to time as uh, invited by the Premier, as will the Cluster Minister. Sure, but I'm asking you, has the Premier been regularly inviting the Education Department, especially oh, when we have so much so, questions uh, to answer that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat what I said before. So the Premier will ask who she wishes to from time to time, and if you ask me more questions about uh, who she seeks to have attendance at the uh, Crisis Cabinet meeting or any other uh, committee meeting she has, is probably a matter for her. Sure. Um, which members, which ministerial staff are in attendance at these meetings? 
look, I, I think I'll only just repeat my, my evidence. Um, if, the, if the Premier wishes to invite ministerial staff, she can from time to time. I, I actually, I, 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 I think, I, I think I've answered the question. I think I've answered the question around uh, crisis policy committee, both the ministerial and uh, senior public service are invited from time to time. What no, ministerial staff? No, I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm hearing what you're no, saying. Mr. Reed, is it the case that the chiefs of staff, the six regular attendees, are invited by the premier to this meeting? I do not know. You'll have to ask the Premier. Sure. Is it the case that the Premier's press secretary attends this meeting? Again, I'll, I'll repeat my answer. You'll have to point those to the Premier. They, you're talking about um, ministerial advisors, ministerial office staff. You've decided to have public servants come and give evidence here today, and we'll give you our evidence on our domain of responsibility. Yeah, you're asking me. You're asking me a question about a cabinet. You're asking me a question about a cabinet committee that is the no, domain of the premier of the day. Okay, sorry, I'm going to interrupt here. We can only have one I'm person. I'm trying to give my answer. Right. Hang on, sorry, Mr. Reardon, uh, With respect, this is difficult enough as it is uh, in terms of trying to capture everybody. Uh, Hansard are trying to record this so that there's an accurate record, and we can only have one person speaking at a time. Uh, we're all hearing the answer, but uh, the questions are in order and you can answer as you see fit, but we just need it to happen in that order. Question, answer, question, answer. We need to be able to keep a record. Understood, Chair. Mr Secretary, are the meeting papers, as a Secretary of Premier and Cabinet, are you distributing the meeting papers for the Crisis Cabinet to ministerial staff? You'll have to repeat that one. It didn't come through clearly. As the Secretary of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, and with your department responsible for the Cabinet papers, are you distributing Cabinet papers to ministerial staff? Uh, we distribute uh, ministerial papers as we would for other Cabinet and Cabinet committees, um, as we would normally do. Do ministerial staff have the power to edit the documents and the advice that has been provided to the Crisis Cabinet? We follow the same protocols we would for any, anyone else, which is uh, to put uh, papers to ministers. Well, under those protocols, do ministerial staff have the ability to change the papers that are distributed to crisis cabinet? So you just again asked me about my scope of role. I've just indicated to you that we would distribute papers for a cabinet or a cabinet committee as per protocol to ministers because they are members of cabinet or a cabinet committee. What do those they? ministers what those ministers then do, Mr. Mookie, would be a matter that you would have to ask those ministers. Sure. Um, is it the case, can you respond or shed any light on this report that the Premier's media director had deleted advice or adjusted the agenda that came from the police department to the crisis cabinet? I have no idea of the media report you're talking about, and I wouldn't speculate on what it means. Well, it's the report that was on the front page of yesterday's Australian, in case you can see it, in which it was reported that the Premier's media director had removed or otherwise deleted uh, advice that was going to the crisis cabinet. Now, I accept that you might not be within your stop to respond, but I just want to give you the opportunity to set aside those concerns and release provide us whether or not that's within the power of the Premier's media director. I don't have any concerns. I just don't know. And I've said to you over many years, I don't really um, get into the media as much as maybe you or others do. So I did not see that article. Okay. Um, how often is the crisis cabinet meeting? Very frequently. Is it meeting daily? Very frequently. At times it can meet daily. Um, at times it can tool down and meet weekly or even fortnightly, depending on the stage of whether it was bushfire. So if you think about a, an incident like a counterterrorism incident, it may only stand up for a week. It may only stand up for a week and a half. For COVID, it's been uh, pretty much unprecedented, the amount of uh, meetings that have been had, and its rhythm has followed where we are with response and recovery. So at times it can be daily, but at times it can be less frequent. Well, can you, can you, but Secretary, in the last two weeks, for example, has it been meeting daily? No. Why hasn't it been meeting daily? Sorry to say that again. What, what are the reasons for it not to be meeting daily in the current last two week period? Um, 
So there are a whole range of meetings that go on uh, during the week. There's National Cabinet, there's Full Cabinet, there's ERC, Delivering Performance Committee, Cabinet, the Crisis Cabinet. Um, so there are a lot of meetings. Uh, if there's a need to meet, I think the Premier pulls people together to meet. But again, you're asking a question which should be directed to the Chair of Cabinet and Cabinet Committees, which is the Premier. So can I just ask... Um, it's, not, it's the Premier's decision when to convene the Crisis Cabinet. That's clear. Yes. And it's not been meeting daily in the last fortnight. Are you in a position to tell us how many, how often is it? Is it, is it every couple of days? Is it once a week? Is it once a fortnight? Like, given we are now in that week eight of the lockdown, like how often is the principal decision making body? So, so for, for periods, Mr. Moody, it is met daily. For good long periods, it's met daily. Um, if there's no need for a meeting, sometimes there can be two meetings in a day. So it depends on the issues. Sometimes we can meet on the weekends um, uh, at very, very short notice. We meet when we need to, um, and the Premier pulls people together to have those meetings. You don't have a can meeting for the meeting's sake. Can I then infer that given the last week we've been recording the highest ever levels of infection since the pandemic began, that the Premier has chosen not to be convening this uh, daily? Is that a fair inference? Uh, no, it wouldn't be. Um, I'm not sure us having a meeting is going to stop case numbers all the time, uh, quite frankly, so I wouldn't agree with your inference. Basically, people are tasked out of uh, crisis cabinet to go and do things. State emergency operations is tasked to do things. The Premier has to take positions to national cabinet. We have to get along with things. We don't have time to sit around and meet for the sake of it. We have to task out through the Secretary's board. So if we need two meetings in a day or if we need a meeting every other day, that's what we do. But we certainly don't Secretary, miss out on what we need to do in terms of our taskings. Secretary, is the Crisis Cabinet and or the Premier making decisions via text messages? Again, you're asking me questions that... I do not know and cannot uh, deal with. Like, you're asking me a question about how the Premier uh, goes about her business. You should direct those questions at the government. Now, you've asked for us to come to budget estimates and answer questions about our budget, which I'm happy to answer all of those questions about our budget, but you're going to keep asking questions that you know have to be directed at political level. You chose to have the people that are here today for a reason, and we will answer everything we, which was, is within our means to answer. Uh, uh, look, Mr. I'm not out that you you stay within the boundary of what you can answer, um, but I'm asking you, is the Shadow Crisis Cabinet always acting on written advice? What's the Shadow Crisis Cabinet? I didn't say Shadow. I said, is the Crisis Cabinet acting on written advice? The, the, the Crisis Cabinet would act on many forms of advice. Does that include making decisions via text message? Can you I have no idea. I have no, I have no idea. I've already answered that question. So, so you're saying to us, Mr. Reed, that as a secretary or premier in cabinet, you have no idea whether the premier is making decisions via text message, as has been reported. That's seriously the evidence you're giving. Is that a statement or a question? It's a question. Oh, I've answered it. Sure. Um, is the health advice coming from the Chief Health Officer going directly to the Crisis Cabinet or is the Premier Cabinet or other departments providing any other forms of commentary or intermediation ahead of that advice being received by the Cabinet? So your question was, does the Chief Health Officer offer advice into the Crisis Cabinet? The answer would be yes. Yes, yeah, so and I'm asking you, is it the case that that advice is going to the Crisis Cabinet unfiltered or do other departments have the opportunity to weigh in on it? Uh, look, it's a matter that's dealt with in Cabinet, but, uh, you know, I can assure you the Chief Health Officer has an opportunity to brief Crisis Cabinet um, at, at every meeting, and that occurs. Thanks. So it's now uh, time for the crossbench, Ms Boyd. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and good morning to you, Mr Reardon and Ms Boyd. Thank you very much for um, your time this morning. Um, Hoping that this is more um, something that you can answer um, directly. I'm just, uh, obviously during a crisis, um, the rest of the, the crises in our society do not um, stop. Uh, and one of them um, that I'm particularly interested in talking to you about this morning is the domestic uh, violence and abuse um, epidemic in our society. Looking at the Premier's priorities, 
um, and the latest data for how we are checking against those premiers' priorities. Um, I noticed that the reducing domestic violence recidivism um, priority is actually getting much worse. So we started at a um, 2015 baseline. Um, we had a target to reduce that by a certain amount. We've actually seen a 1.3% increase in reoffending amongst domestic violence perpetrators um, six years in. We've only got four years left. Um, is it time to accept that the current work that you're doing on this target is not working? You just asked me a policy question. You said that'd be easy to answer. Ah, um, okay, I will make it easier for you. Um, have you changed or has the department changed its approach on uh, the work it's been doing to actually reduce reoffending? So thank you. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, some of that um, within the actual cluster who's got lead on that, which is Stronger Communities uh, Department of uh, Communities and Justice, um, I, I might be able to take on those. So Premier's priority, as you're well aware, um, reducing domestic violence, reoffending. Um, I won't repeat everything you said about the statistics. Yeah, absolutely, it's challenging. But um, as I've said to you before, because you've asked about these things previously, we have a good rhythm in place on um, good habits with the Premier's priority between stronger communities and the Premier's implementation unit. So that's um, going well. So we're measuring what we're measuring. And they don't sit still in terms of uh, trialling things. If they, they trial things that don't work, they'll fail, they'll fail fast, and they'll try, they'll try something else. So they're always at it, I can assure you of that. You made a comment about, is it time to either adjust or look at doing something else? Um, one of the best things about forming habits of staying at very, very difficult Premier's priorities is to stay at them. Now, before you sort of jump to a conclusion to say, but if it's not working, why keep doing the same thing? We don't do that. We keep tilting, trying to do different things. Um, to give you a more fulsome answer, I'd probably have to take it on notice, but um, we're well aware of where those targets are up to. We're well aware of um, uh, making sure that uh, the community are aware that it's top of mind for us, top of mind for the Premier, and we know they're challenging. We wouldn't have picked them if they, uh, they weren't challenging from the Premier advising us to do them and us giving some advice about what the benchmarks might be. Um, we have pushed very, very hard about what a starting baseline would be and what we expected to achieve as a target. Um, they are very challenging by the very nature. If they were achieved easily, they probably wouldn't be a priority. So I'm happy, to take on notice, I'm happy to take on notice any uh, new initiatives we might have underway right now. I just probably don't have enough notes in front of me. Yeah. And I'm sure you, you are correct. I would love to have the policy debate about whether it's a valid um, priority in the first place. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the, um, the opportunity to um, have the Department um, of Community Services and Justice in front of us uh, during this preliminary estimates. Um, but on that, specifically, do you have any data um, as to whether those... Uh, people who are reoffending are reoffending against the same um, victims. Yeah, look, I could probably do a bit of speculation, but I'm going to, I'll take it on notice, okay? That would be useful. If you could tell me the percentage of reoffending re um, that is against the same victims, that would be very useful as opposed to um, these people moving into another relationship and um, and abusing in a separate relationship. If, if the data is available and I'm able to provide it, we will. Okay. If it, the data is available and I'm able to provide it, we will. Thank you. Um, so can you tell me, has the reinvest project received funding in this budget cycle? I don't even know that program, so I'll have to take it on notice. So if you go to the Premier's Priority um, website and to the, to the web page, um, and you link through to this particular priority and it will take you to, the, to a big thing that says, you know, what are we doing on this? Um, one of the things it says you were doing um, is this reinvest program, which is the Kirby Institute um, Sertralin um, approach. I'm aware Just, of some of the Kirby Institute. Uh, yeah, the Kirby Institute does, but I'm not across the detail. I'm just not across the detail. Are you able to take on notice whether that has actually been funded again this year? Should be helpful to you, absolutely. It's a budget question, and that's what we should take on those. Thank you. That would be very useful. Um, just turning to another one of the Premier's priorities, this is the um, priority to increase the numbers of people with a disability in the public sector. 
Um, again, this is another one that's described in the budget as, quote, challenging. Um, it's, um, it's really not doing very well, is it? And wait for you to get the documents in front of you. So, um, yes, it's uh, challenging. You've asked us about it previously. Um, I'll go through a, a few things. Um, as Premier and Cabinet, because that's what you're examining now, uh, that Premier's priority will pass public service. Um, our women in leadership remains above 60%. It's always been strong within the cluster, continues to be so. Um, with the um, bringing in of Aboriginal affairs uh, about two and a half years ago from the machinery government changes in 2019, the department sort of has about 10% of Aboriginal employees, so we're very, very strong there uh, for that obvious reason. Um, people with disability... Uh, across the public service, I think the number's uh, 2.6, or it may have even been 2.5. I can't remember the percentage right at the moment. Within so Premier and Cap... Sorry, oh, you go ahead. just to interrupt you. So the, the numbers of, um, of people with disability who have been employed by the public sector in New South Wales has decreased every year from 2012 to 2018 and has flatlined between 2018 and 2020. Um, so it's shown no increase at all since that priority was set. Um, again, what are you doing to change your approach? Because clearly it is not working. And I take your um, your earlier comment that sometimes things take a while to, to come to fruition. Um, but clearly there's a problem here, isn't it? So I was responding to your question, so I'll keep going. I'm, I'm getting that. So the culture of talking about women in leadership, about um, Aboriginal people in leadership, we're getting there and getting there well. I've got a chief people officer who keeps an absolute um, laser focus on this and does things very, very hard and is extremely passionate about the third link, which is people with disability. So people with disability um, uh, within the Premier and Cabinet cluster is um, uh, just around 4%. So it's not around the mid-twos. We're, we're at 4%. So I'm much more encouraged about where we are. And in saying that, um, we are putting in very practical steps uh, to try and bring more people in. So, for example, um, through the Public Service Commission, which I'm on the board, uh, the advisory board, we don't just talk about getting guidelines and policies. Yes, we have to do that because we know we have to get to 5.6. But in Premier and Cabinet itself, we're trialling just bringing in um, uh, a much more of a bulk recruitment approach for people with disability. We will try and change our marketing. Um, so as we did for uh, people from culturally diverse backgrounds, women in leadership, we try to market ourselves far more effectively in our advertising. So we should be held to account over the next 12 months for how that advertising actually looks. Um, and I'm quietly confident that we'll get there further increases on those numbers within Premier and Cabinet at least um, over the next 12 to 24 months. In the budget estimates, um, sorry, in the budget papers, there is a projection that the numbers of people with a disability in the public sector will magically jump from this kind of 2.4% envisaged at the moment. We, I know we don't have the full figures for the 2020, 21 year, um, up to 4%. So in the, in the budget papers, you have estimated that you're magically going to go from this sort of 2.5% to 4% across the public sector. On what basis do you make that projection? Well, I don't make that projection myself. You probably, I'll, I'll uh, you know, get the Public Service Commissioner to make some comment on that if we need to. What I'm telling you, though, is the practical reality on the ground of a Premier and Cabinet cluster and a Department of Premier and Cabinet, we're at 4%. So it's not magic for us. We're, 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 we're achieving that. We actually want to achieve a lot higher than that uh, again. So practical measures are, as I said, we're looking at far more granular bulk recruitment of people with a disability and actually engaging organisations that can directly match us with people with a disability and actually get um, a, a, a concierge approach that actually champions for people with a disability. So we're looking to employ one person who will basically stand within our organisation um, and be the champion for people with disability, not as an advocate, but to basically say, what do you need within our building? What do you need within our organisation? If you're vision impaired or mobility impaired or hearing impaired, um, to ensure that your workplace is set up for you. And we've copied that homework from another cluster because I think they've done quite well in, in that approach, but that real concierge approach of actually having someone there 
making sure when we recruit someone with a disability, then even before we recruit them, we make sure we meet their needs um, at a far more fine-grained level than we ever have before. So as I say, I'm, I'm actually confident that we're taking action at a, a very, very basic level, not at a policy and procedural level, at a very basic level, to actually get far more effective recruitment of people with disability. Very, very determined to do so. When we talked about it, I think, at the last estimates or the one before that, looking at 2.5 or 2.6% across the public service, we all know we need to do a lot better. And the entire Secretary's Board all know, and they would all respond the same as I am. But in Premier and Cabinet, we're getting there, and we're going okay. We're, we're not perfect, but we're, um, we're at 4%, and we will grow that. My time is up, so I will um, pass over. Uh, yes, thank you. So it's still crossbench time, and I will call on Mr Field. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr Reardon, for being here today and for your team. Uh, my questions primarily relate to uh, climate change and the government's um, response in that regard. Have you read the latest report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? No, I have not. Have you read the summary for policymakers? I'm a tad busy on the pandemic response. Yes, there's a couple of crises going on in the world at the moment. Uh, Mr. Reardon, uh, have you received a briefing of the report? No, I have not. I do not have time for the moment. I've got a bit of a stock uh, for my personal weekend reading on the very things you're talking about, IPCC and others, because um, in my role, I have to get across these things without a doubt. But I just have not had time in the last few weeks to do that. I understand. Uh, is it a policy objective of the New South Wales government to reduce net zero, net carbon emissions to zero by 2050? Policy question, put it to my boss. Uh, well, okay, is it a policy of the government? I mean, you're there to action the policies of the government. You must know what their policies are. I'm not asking you about whether they're going to take a policy. I'm asking you if it is a policy objective of the New South Wales government to reduce net carbon emissions to zero by 2050. I'll take it on notice. I've answered the question as best I can. Otherwise, I'll take it on notice. It is a policy objective of the New South Wales government to reduce carbon emissions by 35% by 2030 from 2005 levels. I'm not sure where this is going with the Premier and Cabinet cluster budget estimates, but I'll well, take it on notice if you wish me to. Then, then this is exactly what the next question is about. Uh, what role does the Department of Premier and Cabinet play in achieving the government's climate objectives? We basically advise the Premier from time to time on the areas of priority that she wishes us to. And um, at this point in time, we're advising her quite a bit on responding to a pandemic. Well, when was the last time the Premier asked for advice from her department about climate action? I would not know, and you'd probably have to point that to her. Um, what is the most recent uh, carbon emission data held by the New South Wales government about total greenhouse emissions in New South Wales. I apologise, Mr Field. Um, could you repeat that one? I didn't get it all. What is the most recent annual emissions data held by the New South Wales government about total greenhouse gas emissions in New South Wales by sector? Um, so I generically get across a lot of areas of domain, but you're just asking me a lot of questions that are for Environment and Energy Minister, Minister's portfolio and the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. Well, actually, these are all of government objectives that cross across all sections of... Uh, in, your, in your view of the world, they, they may well be, but there is a cluster that takes the lead on that called Planning, Industry and Environment Cluster. And I, I would ask the planning uh, industry and environment cluster, but of course they're not attending uh, budget estimates in this. I didn't set up the rules for budget no. estimates. I didn't set up the rules for budget estimates. I'm here as a witness. So can I just ask again, what role does the Department of Premier and Cabinet play in achieving the government's climate objectives? If it's none other than to answer questions as requested by the Premier, just let me know, that's fine. I already answered it. How many New South Wales government agencies have completed the process outlined in the New South Wales Climate Risk Ready Guide, which I understand was announced in the last budget and is a measure designed to prepare government departments for climate adaptation? I do not know. 
So given that all government agencies would be expected, I would imagine, to complete this process, I would have thought that the Premier's department would have some oversight of or some awareness of how many government departments were actually fulfilling those expectations. You can't answer questions about that? I can answer any questions. Mr Field, uh, we have nine clusters and um, in the work breakdown structure of nine clusters, you give accountabilities and responsibilities and leads to many, many of the agencies within those clusters. Many things come through the coordinating centre called Premier and Cabinet, but in a modern contemporary uh, structure of government to try and deliver, uh, the New South Wales Public Service is a pretty flat structure. And that means we have a customer service cluster that takes a lead on various things, cleaning industry environment, we take a lead on various things, regional New South Wales, Premier and Cabinet and Treasury. We are very, very collegiate how we go about those things, but the coordinating and the responsible uh, cluster to oversight some whole of government activities does not always need to be Premier and Cabinet. We devolve and have delegations to other clusters who do a very good job in that regard. And how do disputes when it comes to policy objectives or different decisions get resolved as it, regard, as it relates to achieving climate objectives for the government? So I think clusters are put together to try and have like-minded areas of domain together, planning industry environment being one of them, uh, the Department of uh, Communities and Justice, uh, another with various uh, a cluster lead minister and some, um, and some ministers to try and resolve some of those policy uh, contests. Uh, and that's how they seek to do it. But when you've got competitions between clusters, for instance, Department of Planning, uh, uh, Industry and Environment uh, versus regional New South Wales, how do those disputes get resolved? They normally go upstairs to a thing called Cabinet. That's, that's what I had assumed. So now that we're talking here in budget estimates to um, the Secretary for Premier and Cabinet, can I ask again, how, given that it is actually a policy objective of the government, uh, stated on your website to reduce carbon emissions by 35% by 2030 from 2005 levels. We are less than a decade from that now, and carbon emissions have flatlined for the last couple of years um, through the actions of this government. How are you going to achieve that objective? So you asked me about, you know, if it's two clusters have an issue and, you know, they take it upstairs to a thing called cabinet. There's a two-stage process in how we actually take, um, uh, you know, advice and coordinated responses and coordinated contest of views from around the public service in that two-stage process. That's been in place, I think, for about uh, six years. That's a very, very methodical and structured process that I was uh, fortunate enough to um, uh, basically inherit from my predecessor who set it up uh, in an e-cabinet way. It does allow for a contest of views across all clusters. It allows for no surprises once um, our cabinet has an opportunity to consider those things. So that allows for a decent contest of views. I understand, as you um, made clear at the start, that you are focused on the pandemic at the moment. Um, should that pandemic continue um, for another 12 or so months, and I, I think it's fair to assume that in some way, shape or form, it'll be affecting the New South Wales economy uh, and the community uh, in some way substantially for at least that long. At what point will you read the IPCC's most recent report and summary for policymakers? And at what point will that start to inform decision-making by uh, the New South Wales government about how to achieve its own policy objectives to reduce carbon emissions? When I personally read it, I don't know when I get some time, but I try to spend my Saturday nights uh, getting through my more curious bits of reading. I store them up for them. So if I can get, it, get to it in the next few Saturday nights, I will. It does appear that you're treating these questions a bit flippantly, um, Mr Reardon. This is... I, I am most... not. I'm telling you exactly how I spend my time. And climate change is very climate change is very very important, and I will get to them. I keep myself across what's happening around the world as best I can. But when you're with a state government and a sub-sovereign government, you have to drive service delivery outcomes. Unfortunately, we do have a pandemic, and we do have a lot of other business as usual that we're focused on delivering. Whether that's educating kids, whether that's healthcare, whether that's policing the transport system, that's what we focus on. So where there are Macro policy issues, certainly I'm as curious as the next person in my role, without a doubt, and I'm not being flippant about your questions, absolutely not. 
I will go and get myself across those things. And that is when I actually get a bit of bandwidth to do it. So I will get across them. When I do it, I do not know. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're back to the opposition now, uh, Ms Sharp. Thank you. And thank you, Mr Reid and Ms Boyd, for being here today. We do understand that you're very busy, um, but these questions are also very important. Just to follow up on the last um, the last round of questions, um, and you can take these on notice if you need to, Mr Reardon. How many times has the Crisis Cabinet met since June, the 1st of June? It's been a, a very large number, Ms Sharp. I can't tell you the exact number, but it's, it's quite... Quite a considerable amount of time. Yes, yeah, I'm sure it is. Would you be able to would you be able to provide that to the committee on notice, please? I could count them up. Whether I can actually provide it, I don't know. I don't know if that's cabinet in confidence. I don't know. So I can count them up. We're not asking about the decisions, we're asking about the number of times people gathered. If, if I can, I will. Thank you. And when we, and when you're doing that, could you also provide us um, a list of the times that the education minister attended, the police minister and the mental health minister have attended with their officials to the crisis cabinet. I might just refer a couple of these to Ms Boyd, if that's okay, Michelle. Sure, absolutely fine. Hi, Michelle. Um, the, obviously, the crisis policy committee of cabinet operates under conventions of cabinet confidentiality. The membership is, is at the discretion of the Premier and the attendance of members to the extent that that would tend to reveal the deliberations of that committee would, would likely be confidential. But we can certainly provide you with a total of number of meetings that have occurred over the period of time. So, Ms Boyd, just to be clear, are you saying that you will not provide to the committee um, the number of times that ministers outside the five that you've already said attend, which would seem to suggest to me you are able to tell us who attends? Um, the five, we, I would, the committee would like to know the other ministers that are having input and the number of times that they've done that. I don't, I, I hear what you're saying, but I really do believe that that is not um, breaching cabinet in confidence or the decision making. It is simply telling people who is having input into the decisions while the whole state is in lockdown. So I appreciate the matters that you're raising and it would be appropriate for us to consult with the Premier as Chair of Cabinet about... Um, whether or not those details are provided publicly, and we will do that. Terrific. If you could also provide the number of times that the Premier's media advisor has attended those meetings, that would also be helpful. Um, uh, I'd like to just move on, though, uh, move on now. Oh, sorry, I've got one more question, which is in terms of the decisions that are, the decisions that are made by the Crisis Cabinet, I assume that there is... Secretariat support provided by DPC where those are written down and recorded. Is that correct? That's correct. The usual processes apply. Sure. Um, even how are they managed if they're by text? Sorry, I, I don't understand. Well, Mr. Mulkey was asking questions in the previous round about whether there had been decisions making and, and meetings. You know, we understand that this is a very fast moving environment. We understand that people are doing their best. I'm just trying to understand how, um, whether decisions are made by text, how they are recorded in relation to your system. We record the meetings um, like we would any other cabinet meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually want to ask a question now about vaccine rollout. Um, understand that vaccine rollout is uh, the domain of the federal government and there's been a lot of commentary about that. But I would like to know the status of the vaccine rollout for the public service in New South Wales. Are you able to give us an overview of the planning around that, please? Sure, Ken. Thanks. Um, probably just start from the top. Um, the vaccine rollout has accelerated and continues to accelerate quite a deal now. Um, overnight, we probably hit, I think, 5.3 million um, total doses within the state of New South Wales. Uh, we hit 53% first doses within the state of New South Wales. So we are moving at a pace. Um, we're over 100,000 on a weekday now, and I think last weekend combined we were over 100,000. So it's moving very fast. We talked um, early on in the pandemic about the high-priority essential workers to be um, uh, vaccinated. So that picked up hotel quarantine, 
healthcare workers, aged care workers, and um, those around the hotel quarantine system more generally, and that expanded uh, to pick up uh, others. That meant a lot of those very frontline public service agencies who were directly dealing with the COVID response uh, were covered. The next group out... Sorry, can I, just, can I just stop you there, Mr In? Thank you, and um, acknowledge the work that New South Wales has had to do to get vaccination going, given the, the tardiness of the federal government. Um, are you able to actually tell us, for example, how many healthcare workers working in our hospital system are fully vaccinated? I think you might direct that one to health. Uh, quite frankly, I wouldn't have it in front of me right now, but I can. Can I continue with my response? Well, well, can, well. Can I, uh, in terms of the answer, what I'm really wanting to know is, um, yes, accept that vaccinations are essential and are, and are you know going ahead at pace, which is excellent. But the frontline public service. Um, workers across the state, of which you're the boss of, technically, um, understand they're under different arrangements. I'm trying to understand how you're tracking that. So, for example, what proportion... I want to know what proportion of police are fully vaccinated. I'd like to know the proportion of teachers. We heard at the Public Accountability Committee last week that there's actually no way to track teacher vaccinations. And I'm just wanting to understand what planning is in place at the state level for our public servants... Um, as they go, you know, as we try to keep them at work, return them to work and keep the community safe? So, so a few comments. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I am the head of the public service and their vaccination is uh, top of mind for me, absolutely. As you've seen a lot of media over the last few weeks, and it will be a moving position in terms of employer relations around it's a voluntary um, exercise to be vaccinated and it's an individual's choice and how their information goes into the Australian Immunisation Register is a private matter for that individual. So you get vaccinated, I get vaccinated. Mandating uh, an employee to actually provide that information to an employer, even just mandating them providing that information, whether they need to be vaccinated for certain workplaces, is another matter again. So we don't track the individuals. It's a live discussion right now, though, because it's a reasonable question to ask how many people in the New South Wales public service have been vaccinated over time. The answer to that question at the moment is the bulk of the adult population is showing up to get vaccinated, including the public service. Now, I'll expand on that in a second, but the bulk are. I was working through when I was responding to you about the very front line of high-risk COVID-19 response and trying to vaccinate and give an opportunity for all of those people to be vaccinated. So, for example, I think there are 16,600 sworn police officers. You try to give every single one of those an opportunity to be vaccinated. There's well over 100,000 healthcare workers. You try to give every one of those an opportunity to vaccinate. Aged care workers, um, whilst the responsibility uh, of the, in, in the Commonwealth's domain, we're doing a lot of the vaccinating with the, um, with the GPs on those aged care workers uh, right now. And uh, you want them all to be afforded to need to be vaccinated and so on and so forth. The next ring we want to get to are people clearly like transport workers, freight workers, um, food uh, production uh, workers and food distribution, construction workers, a lot of those either work directly for the New South Wales Public Service or they are contracted to the New South Wales Public Service. And we're moving through those at the moment because they're important areas of the economy. We will can want I, to get sorry, to can everyone... I just stop you there, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Ring, can I just stop you? That, that's um, good to hear. Um, and I'm very pleased to hear that you're accepting people you know, just outside of the public service but who obviously are, are critical. Does that also include community workers who are delivering services like child protection and family support during this time um, being in line? Yeah, they're, they're all in line. You know, look, at this point in time, um, it'd be fair to say uh, three months ago, people were hesitant, people were having a think about different types of vac vaccines without going into brand names. They're not thinking like that anymore. They're rushing to get vaccinated. The fastest way home to get vaccinated is New South Wales Health and GPs have a fairly significant booking system and people should go to that booking system and get booked in for a vaccination. Parallel to that, we've basically had a few priority groups coming through now where we've been running Super Sundays, for example, out at the Sydney Olympic Park, whether that's for food distribution workers, whether that's for construction workers, and without me preempting where we go next, to be fair to say that we will focus on certain high priority areas of the um, of the uh, economy, whether that's transport workers, whether that's teachers, and we've already had some teacher priority already. We will do those in parallel to the vast bulk of bookings. 
But the fastest way for people to get vaccinated right at the moment is just to enter into the booking system like anyone else does and go and get vaccinated or alternatively go to one of the mass vaccination centres where there may be um, uh, opportunities for certain priority groups. So we're doing both, Ms Sharp. And honestly, with over 600,000 uh, doses delivered last week, we will have a very large chunk of the job done over the next couple of months. And the fastest way to do that is to continue using the current distribution channels, the current supply and the current booking system we have. Yes, we can look to prioritise certain cohorts and we'll continue to do that, as I've just pointed out, um, to move things as fast as possible. But New South Wales Health in the vaccination program, through Susan Pearce, the Deputy Secretary of the Vaccination Coordinator for New South Wales, is doing a phenomenal job to push things through as fast as possible. Us being over five, around 5.3 million doses now, if you compare us to any other jurisdiction around the country, we are going very, very fast. I'll just finish off. If there are any other cohorts that you want to put to me, whether it's teachers, whether it's um, uh, social workers, um, let me know and I'll take those away with me now, if you like. Yeah, well, well, the issue is, and look, you know, appreciate that it's, it's, it's ramped up and it's absolutely essential and everyone should be getting, you know, getting vaccinated and we should be encouraging everyone to do so. But my concern just is that there is no way of actually tracking the particularly frontline, um, you know, workers in the in the New South Wales Public Service about whether they're vaccinated or not. I mean, is that it, as we go down the, this path and as as people are able to book, and I, you know, I know you've said that it's easy to book. It's easier than it has been. The last few weeks has been very difficult. Been very difficult for some, um, you know, age groups and all of those. But I, my my issue really is is that is there going to be a system where you will know what percentage, even if it's not in necessarily individuals within the public service, like police, as I said, um, hospital workers, uh, cleaners in schools, um, you know, the, the people who are who are day to day mixing with a lot of people because that's their essential work. Are we going to be able to 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 know that? Yeah, I think I said at the start, live question right at the moment. So people in the media are you know commenting on uh, vaccine passports where it might be not mandatory to um, have a vaccination, but you will need one for access to various places, whether that's a construction site, whether that's to go to another state like Queensland or Western Australia. Um, you know, the, these things are sort of not mandated, but they kind of are. Um, so that's a live question. Us recording the amount of New South Wales public servants that have a vaccination, I'll go back to what I said, it's an individual choice, it's voluntary, it's collected in the Australian Immunisation Register for that person's private information. It is an open question how we might need to go through our own workplaces and workforces about do you need a vaccine and double uh, double dose of vaccine to come yeah. to a job? And, I, and I so understand the question you're asking. Yeah, so, so, so to be clear, is that is that work that work's being undertaken now? We've we've taken some advice on that even earlier in the year, but that is a live question right now, absolutely. And so the consideration of vaccine passports and, and that kind of thing is, is part of that discussion. Yeah, whether they're called vaccine passports or just some form of proof to say that you have been vaccinated for a thing called COVID-19, noting that also, you know, my, 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 my personal information on my gov would show COVID, flu vaccine, COVID vaccine um, in that order. So it's how much privacy that goes around this uh, um, Mine personally, I'm happy for my employer to know, know all about it, but that's an individual question for people and employers at this point in time uh, can't mandate someone showing up and saying, uh, show us your um, COVID-19 response in the New South Wales Public Service, and it's a live question that we'll need to do more work on, without a doubt. Terrific. Can I just follow up on that, Mr Ridden, and this could be either to you or Miss Boyd. I hope my microphone is better. I've switched my audio. Um, uh, the... Uh, have you actually sought legal advice about whether or not you have the power as the employer of over 400,000 people to mandate vaccination? Yeah, we took some advice earlier on in the year, actually, because we knew that when the very first, uh, uh, you know, work groups got prioritised, you might remember the federal government came out with phase 1A and then phase 1B and phase 2. Uh, the people in phase 1A, um, you know, want to know whether this is mandatory or voluntary, whether you could asked for, um, you know, what vaccination status people had. So we took some advice earlier on the year. 
Um, we've um, been listening to the debate, um, uh, quite frankly, and we know we need to do more work on that. But at this point in time, it's a voluntary exercise. There may be requirements to actually enter uh, certain workplaces or other jurisdictions, as I said, which will require a vaccination and therefore proof of that vaccination, but not mandatory in a workplace at this point in time because that's been the nature of it. But it's a live question. I'll, I'll get Ms Boyd to just follow up on that. I do, and look, just I appreciate, Mr. Eden, that that was a very good elucidation of what the policy is. But just if Ms. Boyd can specifically address whether the legal advice you obtained said you have the power as an employer to require vaccination. Oh, look, I won't go into the specifics of the advice. It's obviously privileged, but um, I think as a general proposition, employers in New South Wales have the power to give lawful and reasonable directions to employees. Um, including in relation to vaccination. So I won't be drawn on the specifics of, of the sure. advice. It obviously differs in respect of the risks that apply in the workplace, but the, the general principle is that employers have that power. Thank you. Did you obtain that advice from the Crown Solicitor or did you go to an external firm or who gave you the advice? Or a council? Or... Well, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on, on the specifics of, of a particular advice in this forum. Well, I'm just interested, was that in-house advice or at least external? Can you tell us whether or not the DPC produced the legal advice with your own lawyers or did you go elsewhere? Um, look, no, I don't, I don't think that's relevant to the committee's um, proceedings here today, but, um, oh. you know, I think the general... Oh, the sorry, general can I stop you there, Miss... I'm, I'm sorry, Miss Boyd, it actually is relevant to the committee's questions because we're trying to understand, you know, we try to understand uh, where the advice came from, but similarly we want to understand... Uh, who who paid for it and how much it cost? Um, I, I think we gave an answer. I, look, you've asked us to come here. This is budget S, Premier and Cabinet Cluster. Um, we'll struggle to get a budget question as uh, usually happens. Um, if this was a COVID inquiry, we probably should have called it a COVID inquiry, but um, it's budget estimate, so I, I don't know if you've got any else to add. Look, Sorry, I'm going to intervene okay. here just quickly. Um, with respect to everybody involved and in particular the witnesses, the questions are in order and the questions can be whatever uh, members of parliament wish to, wish to ask. Um, you can answer them however you see fit. Uh, and we do understand that there are issues of uh, privilege in relation to actual advice, uh, but I would ask that they're not the questions aren't debated. We understand the situation that you're in and we'll deal with each one of these um, as they come up. Uh, but they are in order. Thanks, Chair. Mr. Eden, can I ask, the policy about deciding whether or not employees of the state are required to have vaccination, is that going to be determined centrally by either the Public Service Commission or DPC, or is it going to be left to each agency or department to resolve the policy for their employees? We'll try and make it as consistent as we can. Therefore, employee relations sits within Premier and Cabinet um, and uh, the Public Service Commissioner also sits within the Premier and Cabinet cluster. So they will take a lead on a lot of that advice, taking advice also from General Counsel, uh, Kate Boyd. Uh, we'll try and make it as consistent as possible. But there will be certain industrial instruments where if that has to vary, then so be it. But generally, we'll try and make it as consistent as we can. And are you as we've done, as, uh, Sorry, I was just finishing. As we've done for pandemic leave, as we've done for special leave and things like that for the last 18 months. Are you in a position to tell us when the, um, that central guidance, for want of a better term, will be provided to departments and agencies? Uh, no, not at this point. I'll take it on notice oh. because, as I said, it's a, it's a live issue right at the moment. Oh, look, I appreciate that. And look, equally, I'm, I'm asking, as given the New South Wales government is Australia's biggest or second biggest employer, your standards will be heavily um, determine a lot of behaviour in the private sector as well, just to be clear, which I guess brings me to the other question, which is, have you sought advice about your obligations under the Workplace Health and Safety Act? Legal advice, that is. Uh, we sort of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if we've got anything specific that flowed on from the other advice, so I'm happy to take it on. But um, just on your comment about um, being the largest employer, we, we certainly know our place in the Australian economy and the Australian workplace arrangements. Over the last 18 to 20 months, that's actually been tested over and over, so I'm glad you brought it up because when it comes to return to work policy, when it comes to our social distancing within the workplace, our human resource policies and procedures, 
the New South Wales Public Service has actually played an incredible lead role, just purely because of our scale, and it's meant that we could pilot and test a whole range of things that you are right, the private sector has followed us on. Sure, thank you, Mr. And look, uh, my time is about to expire, and the last, the last question here is, have you sought advice about whether or not uh, people who are accessing, well, the tens of thousands of people who access government premises, uh, ha are, you have an obligation to ensure that or check their vaccination status in case it poses a workplace health and safety risk to your staff? Which, is, to be yes. fair, is another question a lot of other employers are trying to resolve about your control of your premises, given that that is equally a place of uh, disease distribution. Yeah, look, I think it'll be a live question for the next couple of months. We wouldn't have been having this conversation six months ago. We'd be talking about a COVID-safe workplace that it meant spacing, one per four square metre rule, good hand sanitisation, wearing face masks. Now that we've got vaccination, it's another um, string to the bow where we may need to consider those things. But it's a live question. I think we'll be working on that for the next couple of months. We'll have to resolve it without a doubt, but um, it's live. I'll take on notice whether we've actually uh, sought any specific advice on it. Uh, the crossbench, Mr. Shoebridge, Willem Spoyd. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I hope that's coming through reasonably clearly. Um, uh, Mr. Ridden, Ms. Boyd, thank you for coming today. Uh, Mr. Ridden, did I understand it? Did I understand your answers correctly? The, there's some hesitancy from you about telling this committee when the crisis cabinet has met. You, you, you have some hesitancy about telling this committee when the crisis committee met? No. Well, when can you tell us the dates upon which the crisis cabinet committee has met since it was formed, please? Yeah, I, I just sort of referred to the general counsel to give a response to what we can and can't provide. So you can repeat that if you wish. Oh, good morning. I think, believe we've taken on notice to provide the total number of meetings that have occurred since the 1st of June and then consult with the Premier about um, whether or not we can provide information as to the invitees to those meetings. Well, you see, Mr Reid and Ms Boyd has said she's seeking advice as to whether or not she will tell this committee the basic information in that case only about the number of occasions it's met. So, Mr Reid, and I say to you, I ask you again, why is there a hesitancy in telling this committee um, when the crisis cabinet has met? Why won't you just commit to giving us that information? I think we just answered the question. I, I think what, we, what I would say is that the crisis policy committee of cabinet operates in accordance with conventions of confidentiality, as, as you're aware. So it's appropriate for us to consult with the chair of that committee, being the premier, about the level of detail that we provide in relation to those matters, and we're happy to do that. Mr Reardon, this crisis cabinet committee, however it's described, <laughs> has been mapping out the future for more than 8 million people in this state. And you can't make a clear commitment here today to even tell us when it meant. So I'm going to ask you very clearly, please tell us the dates upon which the Crisis Cabinet Committee has met since it was created. Point of order, so, Madam Chair. Mr Shoebridge, I've answered the question yes, twice sorry. General Council twice so far. Sorry, Mr Ridden. Um, uh, Mr Franklin, on point of order. Um, my point of order is simply that the witness has never said on a number of occasions that he's taking this question on notice and the specifics therein. Uh, I think, therefore, it's unreasonable for the witness to continue to be questioned um, and that, that we should move on. Uh, well, it, just in relation to the point of order, perhaps it's worth clarifying. I think what's been taken on notice is uh, that the witnesses have said they'll provide the amount of meetings, uh, but not necessarily the dates of the meetings. So that's my understanding of what's being teased out. I said that accept your be... point in terms of we don't want to spend another hour repeating the same situation. I, I accept your point, uh, but I don't, I don't know that that question has been uh, properly answered. Well, the council said very clearly that she'd be looking, she'd ask all of those issues of the the chair of that committee, which is obviously the premier, which is the appropriate thing to do, because you don't want to inadvertently breach cabinet and confidence. This is just insane. Understood. Look, there are issues of privilege here, but members are entitled to ask uh, whatever questions they want and they can pursue as much detail as they want and the witnesses can answer uh, in any way they see fit and that's what's happening. To the point of order, Madam Chair. 
the suggestion that telling the people of New South Wales when the crisis cabinet met is somehow a breach. I'm not of suggesting that at all, David. That's, that's insane. insane. You know, I'm not suggesting I'll that. I'll let you. Okay, I'll let so you we're not going to have an argument about this anymore. Without speaking over you, Mr. Franklin. So no, we can't you're, just you're let one person speak at a time. This is difficult enough, enough as it is. In relation to the point of order, I've ruled, like I've, I've given an indication of the answer. The question um, is in order, uh, and it can be pursued um, as it's being pursued, and the witnesses can answer uh, as they see fit. Mr. Reid, and I'll make it simple. When has the crisis cabinet met? Please provide all the dates to this committee. Thanks, Mr. Shearage. Just I'll, I'll try and help as best I can. So I think a number of meetings, dates of meetings, memberships of meetings, and other invited guests are the questions that I think I've been asked. We'll take those on notice. Does that clarify for you? Well, it'll clarify it when I get the answers, Mr. Reardon, but I note you're taking it on notice and I look forward to the answers. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Reardon, the Public Accountability Committee has requested the production through the standing orders of the Upper House, the production of the health advice provided to Cabinet, including Cabinet subcommittees, um, from the commencement of the current COVID outbreak. To date, those documents have not been provided to the Public Accountability Committee. Are you and Ms Boyd intending to produce those documents? Um, I'll just make a couple of comments and then hand over to General Counsel. Um, I'm assuming like every other request we've had from the House, uh, we'll attend to them as quickly as we can, you know, just for update on stats and status. Financial year 2020-21, we produced 166 orders for papers under uh, standing order 52 and documents. That was about, I think, 1,500 boxes of privileged and non-privileged documents. Chair, um, I'm just going to take Nearly 11,500 staff. Mr. Reardon, I'm, coming, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to your question. Chair, coming to your question. Chair, Chair, could I ask you to direct Mr. Reardon to answer the question? Oh, sure, not a general, to be directed. A general digression on other, other SO52s. I'm telling you where we spend our time and our resources, and you've asked me about one specific public account committee. I'm telling you we've had to respond to well over 100, 166 just in the last financial year. Mr. I haven't even got to the current financial year. Okay, sorry, we can't. This is real quick. Sorry, excuse me, Mr. Shibridge and Mr. Reardon, please. We can't operate, this is difficult enough, enough as I have said, uh, doing this online. Hansard need to record it. There needs to be a proper record of this meeting. We cannot operate with people speaking over the top of each other. Um, uh, I, uh, Mr. Reardon, I understand that you can give um, some more information around your answers. That's perfectly appropriate. Uh, Mr. Shoebridge has asked you to be specific in relation to his question. That is also appropriate. Uh, if we can be as specific as possible about the question, but I understand, you know, if you do need to give some information around it. Well, Madam Chair, to assist Mr Reardon, I will restate the question and make it very clear how narrow it is. It's a question about the production to the Public Accountability Committee of the orders that have been passed under the standing orders by the Public Accountability Committee in relation to the health advice provided to Cabinet. Will you produce them? If so, when? And why have they not been produced to date? Is this the matter where I wrote back to the committee in the last week or so? Yes, and you you produced documents that did not respond to the order, Mr. Reardon. Okay, I'll hand over to General Counsel if you would mind. Um, thank you, Tim. No um, so, the request from the committee for health advice was acknowledged in accordance with the usual practice, and that request was referred to the responsible minister, being the Minister for Health and Medical Research. And I understand that that minister responded on the 9th of August voluntarily providing certain documents to the committee. Um, it is not DPC's place to produce documents of other ministers and other agencies. We simply coordinate the requests from the committee and the House for papers. Um, I understand that, that that request has been dealt with. Ms Boyd, you would know from your own involvement in the matter that the documents produced did not respond to the order None of the advice was produced and there was no stated intention to comply with the order. Is, is that 
Is that where the matter rests at the moment? No stated intention through you or through Mr Reardon to comply with the order? It's not a question for us, I don't think, Mr Shoebridge. I think that that's a question for the Minister for Health and Medical Research as to whether or not he wishes to provide any further information in response to that request. Ms Boyd, the convention on the production of documents through the House is that the communication occurs and the exchange occurs through um, the Department of Premier and Cabinet. This is the first time I've seen it suggested that the Parliament needs to negotiate separately with the uh, portfolio minister. Are you saying there's a separate process being adopted for this SO52 or this call for papers more accurately? Is that, is that to me or to Ms Boyd? I, I, I commenced the question by putting it to Ms Boyd, Mr Reardon. Not at all. There's no separate process. It is always the case that the responsible minister you know, is responsible for answering those calls for papers, whether be they from a committee or the House. And that, that is what has occurred here. DPC coordinates the initial uh, request, provides it to the responsible minister, and then coordinates the return of papers back to the House so that the clerk's office really has one point of contact on all requests. But it is not for us to decide what goes back to the House for the responsible minister. So that, that's, that's simply all I meant. Ms Boyd, is the government taking the point that it doesn't believe committees have the power to require the production of documents? Is that part of the government's response to the Public Accountability Committee's request for documents? Oh, look, I can't speak for ministers and for the government, but what I can say is that Premier's Memorandum 2017-01 makes clear that there is some doubt to the power of committees to call for papers. Um, it is an uncertain field, and given the uncertainty, it is appropriate that where committees want papers, they should refer that matter to the House for an order understanding of 52. That is the position as per that Premier's memo, and I would simply refer to that. Mr Reardon, you understand that the opposition and the crossbench have been seeking to cooperate in a public health process with the government and, and have agreed to, to not having the House sit um, so as best as possible to assist in dealing with the public health crisis. But you also understand that that was on the basis that there would be genuine, um, genuine compliance with the government and assistance with the government to the COVID oversight run through the Public Accountability Committee. Do you understand how refusing to produce documents is not consistent with cooperation with the Public Accountability Committee? I'll, I'll make a quick comment then hand across. Um, but like your agreements at political level of what you do is a matter for you, including setting up these budget estimates without any ministers here. That's that's your 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 business um, and how you do that. I believe that Miss Boyd has just responded in terms of complying with what your request was. If I can have her repeat or add in anything you wish to. I would I would only say that we fully appreciate the importance of the the scrutiny function of the House at this time. And all efforts have been made from the public sector's perspective to continue to produce papers to the House on Standing Order 52. And indeed, by our presence today, we are seeking to facilitate that important scrutiny role. I understand Minister Hazard and Dr Chan also appeared at the Public Accountability Committee hearing on the 10th of August. So efforts are being made to ensure that the House can continue this important work at this time. Mr Reardon, will you provide to this committee the public health advice that has been provided to the Crisis Cabinet or the public health advice that has been provided to the Premier? I'll have to take that on notice. Mr Reardon, uh, does the Premier obtain written public health advice um, from the Chief, Chief Health Officer? Um, and if so, um, is, it a, is it a daily basis um, or is there some other regularity to the provision of written advice? So there's a whole range of advices, uh, written and verbal, from a whole range of uh, areas, whether they're Treasury, the Chief Health Officer or any other, um, uh, you know, person that has to uh, brief into a crisis cabinet and they're the same as they would be for any other cabinet or cabinet committee. Yep. Mr Reardon, if you'd respond to my question about the advice from the Chief Health Officer rather than a general digression, please. 
I'm not giving a general di digression. I don't know if I can go in any more detail on it. Just did. If you want to ask me a specific question, I'll take it on notice. On how many occasions has the Chief Health Officer provided written advice to the Crisis Cabinet? On how many occasions has the Chief Health Officer provided written advice to the Premier since this most recent COVID outbreak commencing in mid-June? In response to question one and response to question two, I'll take on those. Mr Redden, you, 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 you failed to provide a, a, a coherent answer to questions that were asked to you about whether or not you saw text messages um, um, being exchanged between crisis cabinet members. Um, surely, Mr Redden, as the custodian of the cabinet documents of the government, which is your role as cabinet secretary, you need to actually understand whether or not cabinet decisions are being made by text message. Why won't you provide clarity on this? I thought I did. You didn't. Why do you have access to the text messages that are, are that are being exchanged between crisis cabinet me members that are part of the crisis cabinet decision making process as cabinet secretary? So I know my role as cabinet secretary, as does Miss Boyd. Um, we basically record cabinet decisions in cabinet and crisis cabinet and any other subcommittee as per usual. Um, the text messages between members of government are matters that you might ask members of government. Mr. Reardon, if decisions are being made by text message and you don't have access to that, how can you fulfil your role as the Cabinet Secretary and the custodian of those documents? There was a lot of inference in that. You would have to ask the questions to the members of Parliament who are ministers um, about what they exchange in text and whether they are decisions or otherwise. I could only speculate otherwise. Mr Reardon, you spoke about the vaccine system in place in New South Wales for members of the public to access, what system were you talking about? Uh, it's a fairly vast vaccine program. So just to go through it, New South Wales Health has a vaccination program up and running that involves a very large hub and spoke arrangement across the state. That includes a range of mass vaccination hubs, one in Newcastle, one in southwestern Sydney at, um, and more mini ones, one at Sydney Olympic Park and now another one at Kudos Bank Arena and various other spokes um, in both uh, regional cities and, uh, and smaller towns. Overlaid on that is um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of general practitioners plus a range of pharmacists across the state um, and uh, just in-reach programs to areas like uh, aged care and disability care. So it's quite considerably large. The supply arrangements come from the federal government, um, as you might be aware from a lot of media around that. Uh, those supplies are provided through a vaccination coordinator general, uh, Lieutenant General JJ Fruin, uh, provides those um, vaccinations to the state of New South Wales um, on an allocation basis, and then through all of those distribution centres, um, uh, vaccinations are undertaken. For the customer, being the members of the public of New South Wales, they can go through a booking system to book in when they can receive that vaccination. Um, and that is happening at a very large scale. As I said um, last week, we were above uh, 600,000 doses for the week. Yeah, you talk about a booking system. The Service New South Wales Act takes you to the federal booking system. Um, and, and if you were, for example, an 18 year old at the moment going through that system, um, and unless you had a priority basis for a vaccination, Okay, we've lost Mr. Shoebridge mid-question. Just give him one second uh, to see if he can reboot. That's a shame. Uh, and if not, there's just a couple of minutes left on um, his time. We might go to the opposition and then we can come back to it. Looks like something's happening. Just give me one second. Chair, if possible, I'd take the last. Oh, sorry, Chair. I, <laughs> no, welcome back, Mr. Shearage. 
I, I mentioned to committee members earlier that Ausgrid were taking out the power at some point for um, maintenance. Um, it may be that that's what's just kicked in. Um, Mr. Redden, I was asking you about um, vaccine booking systems. Um, as a, the, the, the Service New South Wales app, uh, if you go to book a vaccine on it, it takes you to the federal system um, for booking of vaccines. And if you're an 18-year-old and you don't have a priority reason for getting a vaccine, it tells you that it won't take a booking from you. Do you think that's acceptable? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Well, the question is, um, the, the proposition that's put to you is that if you go through the Service New South Wales Access um, um, portal and you seek to get a vaccination as an 18-year-old and you don't have a priority reason for getting it, you're told you can't make a booking. So the question is, do you think that's an acceptable outcome? Uh, don't, I won't speculate on opinions on acceptable outcome. We want to vaccinate everyone in the state um, above uh, 16 as fast as possible, and that's what we're doing. So I'll answer your question, which is there are, the, the criteria to actually receive priority for a vaccination has continued to move as we've moved through. Um, so the criteria to begin with was um, aged care was a whole range of um, priority groups in that phase 1A, 1B. It quickly expanded to get people above 70 years old vaccinated as fast as possible. There are a couple of the target advices along the way about AstraZeneca and the use of Pfizer, which I'm uh, being well uh, ventilated in the in the media. Um, we are now at a position where we are looking to vaccinate very large priority groups who are um, uh, younger ages. And the premier's just announced that, that we've received 530 extra Pfizer doses to um, really focus on the um, uh, the local government areas of concern within Sydney right now. So. Um, there may be some areas where um, uh, uh, an 18-year-old may only receive AstraZeneca at this point in time because there's no other vaccine uh, available for them. But I think that will quickly um, move to a position where there is vaccinations available for everyone. If you've got a specific... Um, Mr. Reardon, if you've Mr. got Reardon. a specific... Sorry, I'm, I'm just wanting to help. If you've got a specific customer feedback, um, let me know because we're looking to vaccinate everyone as fast as we can. If there is a booking Mr. system... Reden, this is not a specific customer feedback. This is about basic access to a life-saving vaccine. When will there be enough vaccine so that everybody in New Point South Wales... Point of order, Madam Chair. Yes, yes, Mr Franklin. Also, this will be the final bit for the this section of crossbench time. Mr Franklin? That was in fact my point of order, that I think that the uh, member is cutting unfairly into the important questions of the opposition. Oh, well, thank you so much, Mr. Franklin, for your support. Uh, it is the opposition's time. There is another um, uh, period for crossbench time. Uh, this, the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Secretary, has your department ever expressed any concern about how the transport asset holding entity is recorded in the budget? Sorry, uh, Premier and Cabinet expressed a concern on that. Is that your question? Yes, about how it's recorded in the budget. Uh, not that I'm aware. Um, I, you know, wearing a, a hat from some time ago, as you'd be aware, um, as Transport Secretary, I certainly had a position on that from that cluster. But uh, not that I'm aware. Um, basically, Treasury and Transport have largely dealt with that. I'll take on notice if there's anything specific um, on that, but I can't recall us having a specific position on it. Can you take on notice as well, Mr. Eden, whether or not your department has expressed any concerns about the safety risks of the TAHI operating model? Um, I don't know if I need to take that on notice because certainly the issues raised between the clusters of Treasury and Transport um, would have expressed um, their views. I do not believe we've taken a view. And when it comes to the safety of transport operations and specifically the safety of rail operations. The Office of National Rail Safety Regulator has oversight of that and we would be not in a position to provide advice around the rail safety regulatory arrangements. I personally could, but it's not my role in my current role to actually have a view on that. Sure. As, well, then perhaps I'll, I'll just, on, on this particular aspect of the questioning, um, as Secretary, and look, to be fair, as a previous Secretary of the Transport Department, did you support the establishment of the Transport Asset Holding Entity? Uh, look, whether, so in terms of uh, the Transport Asset Holding Entity, it's a, 
it was a, a vehicle basically to look at um, centralised asset management and efficient asset management from um, the start of Transport for New South Wales in 2011. So inherently for the efficient bringing together of assets across uh, rail, across light rail, across roads, across ferries, in concept is a sensible thing to do for um, a cluster um, and it uh, accords with the infrastructure New South Wales asset management policy, its asset management framework. So it's inherently a sensible thing to do. Health could do the same thing, education, etc. cetera. Um, beyond, you, that, be, beyond that, um, uh, there, there's, it's too broad of a question to get into what I think about, um, whether okay, it's well, account, I'll, accounting, I'll you, accounting treatment or anything else. I'll ask you a more specific question. Have you had any meetings with any departmental secretary about the transport asset holding entity in the last eight months? I, over the years, as transport secretary and premier cabinet secretary, absolutely yes. Did you have meetings last year with the secretary of transport and treasury, either separately or together? May have, could take it on notice, but uh, more than likely did. And what was discussed at that meeting? I wouldn't recall. I'd have to take it on notice. Did either of the treasury secretary or the transport secretary? Uh, express concerns about operating the Tahi model? I'll, I'll line them up. I'll take it on notice. Uh, did any of them advise you that there were risks to the budget or risks to the safety operating um, if Tahi was to commence in July last year? And, and this was about, uh, you were talking about meetings last year? Yes. Still? Yeah, okay, take it on notice. I, I, I can't recall. Do you recall any particular meeting last March with the Treasury Secretary and or the Transport Secretary together? No, I can't recall. Were those two secretaries in dispute um, about the establishment of the Transport Asset Holding Entity? There's certainly a contest of views on um, establishment of the Transport Asset Holding Entity and I believe it made some media attention. Did either of them seek a meeting either through you or independently of you with the Premier to express their concerns? Uh, I'll take it on notice. I, I just don't... Like, you're asking me about diary dates again. Uh, well, no, I'm actually asking you about whether or not either of them... I, 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 uh, can't, I, can't, many... I, I can't... I I actually don't know. Did the Premier ever raise with you the concerns that had been expressed to her by a departmental secretary about the transport asset holding entity? So this matter ended up um, being considered by Cabinet at various times, so um, I'll take them on notice at the moment. Sure, but did the Premier ever seek a brief from your department about the concerns being raised by any other any department secretary, or specifically either the Treasury Secretary or the then Transport Secretary? The, the, the advisories would have come from Treasury and Transport themselves. They are expert in that, those areas. Um, I can't recall whether we were asked for advice. I'll take that on notice. Thank you. Um, I've only got two more questions before I pass to my colleagues on this. Has the Auditor General asked DPC for access to all cabinet documents regarding the transport asset holding entity? I understand that is the case. Did the Premier agree to waive cabinet privilege over all documents relating to the, all cabinet documents relating to the transport asset holding entity? Just to be helpful, I'll hand that one to General Council. Yes, thank you, General Council. Um, the Auditor Order General's uh, enabling legislation does not um, allow the Auditor General to seek or compel the production of Cabinet documents, but the Government has agreed to provide those to the Auditor General to assist with the audit. Yes, I, I'm um, aware of the procedures and the powers, but the specific question was, did the Premier, has the Premier waived privilege under her, the memorandum that gives her that power uh, to produce all the documents that have been requested by the Auditor General? No. Which documents has the Premier withheld from the Auditor General? No documents have been withheld, but no privilege has been waived. So have all the Cabinet documents requested by the Auditor General been provided to her? Yes. When would that take place? I'd have to take that on notice, but I believe it was fairly recently. The documents have been provided on a confidential basis, so privilege has not been waived in relation to the documents, but they have been provided to assist the Auditor-General with her important work. Thank you. I'll pass back to my colleagues. I think that's me. <laughs> um, yes, Penny's nodding. Uh, hello, Mr Reardon and Ms Boyd. Um, it's Rose Jackson here. Um, I just have a couple of questions and then um, Ms Sharp might have a few depending on how we go with the time. 
Um, I was just wondering if DPC is still considering the unsolicited proposal to either sell or enter into a long-term lease of the heritage-listed 50 Phillip Street building, which is also known as the Chief Secretary's Office building. Just give me one second. Uh, look, just in terms of answers to proposals um, and the confidential nature of them, uh, the, the, the proposal you speak of, I'm clear about. Whether it's on our website, um, I do not know. I can it is on your up. website. It yeah, is. So, so, I can assure so, you of that, Mr. Ridden. So, so its current status, I'll take on notice because I'm not sure what I can know. Well, I read on your any. website that its current status is it is in stage two. Um, which is intended to be finalised by quarter three, 2021, which is, of course, the quarter that we're in. Um, and then there will be a recommendation as to whether to proceed to stage three. So is it still under active consideration as part of stage two? And when is the recommendation in relation to stage three intended to occur? Spot on word for word for um, what's on the website. I just caught up to you then. So, I can um, read. Yeah, indeed. Um, so uh, I just wasn't sure what was up there. So that's where it's up to. It's under active consideration. And um, timing-wise, uh, I'll take on notice because, look, there are a whole range of unsolicited proposals I have there, but I'll take on notice and if I can give you any more information on that timing, I will. I mean, mo most, if not all, of the unsolicited proposals that are listed there um, relate to planning and development matters. And I was wondering if you could clarify how the unsolicited proposal process that is managed by DPC relates to the planning process and in particular in relation to heritage matters? So the unsolicited proposal is um, a, a commercial proposition that's put to us. It has to you know, pass the limits, as you'd be aware if you've read a bit of the website on uniqueness, value for money and a whole range of other uh, considerations. Planning still does its planning approvals process. Um, it can do some of that in parallel, but it basically takes it on its merits as it sees fit, including any impacts on the environment and in any impacts on heritage. So it does so, its normal yeah. job. And it passes that information to you, to DPC, who makes the final recommendations in relation to the projects proceeding. Is that correct? It, no, it, it basically undertakes its own planning approval process and it stands on its merits. So is the, for example, in relation to the, um, propo the proposal at 50 Phillips Street, um, has the planning minister expressed a view in relation to planning processes about that proposal? So they remain completely separate. So the planning minister may have, I don't know that myself, um, but because the planning minister and that cluster, planning minister and environment, have uh, full jurisdiction to approve or otherwise a proposal, they may or may not advise us. Of, we end up being basically a conduit for a proponent uh, to put a proposition forward. If it, it meets um, certain criteria under unsolicited proposal guideline, that's fine, but it then will be um, planning assessed like any other proposal. So whether the planning minister is across this one, I do not know. Um, and it may not be appropriate for him to even express anything back to us. Um, we are here to put forward a proposition that meets certain limbs that becomes a proposal or it doesn't, if it makes it to stage two or stage three, and it will then be planning assessed um, either in parallel or subsequently. But Ms Boyd, do you want to add anything? Oh, no, I have nothing to add to that. That's okay. exactly Would you be able to take on notice whether the planning minister or representatives from DPIE in particular heritage have expressed a view in relation to the adaptive reuse of the Chief Secretary's office as a commercial hotel? Yeah, my, my best um, view would be that they absolutely would have expressed many views on it already and they would be consulted about it um, already. Um, I'll take on notice if that's the general view, are they consulted and, and where is it up to? What their view is, um, you know, might end up being a matter for them because ultimately they become the planning approver or otherwise and um, that's kind of a matter for them under Environmental Planning and Assessment Act. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'll hand over to you, Ms Sharp. Thank you, Ms Boyd. I realise that you have to go um, very quickly. I just wanted to get some clarity about who 
drafts the public health orders. My understanding was that health had been doing them up to a certain date, um, and then there was um, then there's a role for you um, in DPC. Um, could you just explain to us how that occurs, please? Um, the process has been fairly consistent since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, there is a range of agencies that participate in the drafting process. Obviously, police, health, DPC, the Department of Customer Service, to the extent that they produce plain English guidance on the orders um, on the website. So all of the, the legal teams in those departments participate in the drafting of the orders, and the Parliamentary Council's office undertakes the drafting on instructions from either DPC Health, uh, depending on um, where the instructions come from. So who, could you just clarify who gives the instructions? It's, it doesn't come from you as the central point. Is that what you're saying? Um, if the decision were to emerge from National Cabinet or the Crisis Policy Committee of Cabinet, it would usually fall to the Department of Premier and Cabinet to lead on the instructions to Parliamentary Council. Um, but if the matter was a health matter that um, the, you know, the Minister for Health had requested a particular order, then health may lead, but there is a very consultative and collaborative approach and everybody is aware, you know, when instructions are, are going through for a new order. But they're funnelled, but just to be clear, they're funnelled through you, Miss Boyd. I, I am aware of instructions at all times, yes. And do the instructions then go back to the crisis cabinet for approval or, or are they more impl implemented after the decisions have been made in crisis cabinet? Yeah, they're implemented after, in, in the main, yes. And, um, okay, thank you. Um, look, this is, I, I think we're almost, I'm almost out of time. Um, I will ask one final question to probably to Mr. Reardon, um, which actually goes back to some of the issues that were raised by um, uh, Ms. Abigail Boyd earlier, which is about the um, port stacking of a number of the Premier's priorities. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the continuing increase in the number of vulnerable children who are being re-reported after the uh, Department of Communities and Justice have closed their cases. Um, can you tell us what action is being undertaken in relation to this? Uh, thanks, Ms Sharp. Look, I've, I have this, the status and baseline and target in front of me, and I have the current status. I don't have a whole range of um, commentary on actions for cure and rectification of some of those with me, so I'll take it on notice. I apologise, I do not have enough data. No, thank you. And, and as I said, I know that COVID has dominated a lot of your work, but given that you you're, you are, your your department is responsible for driving the achievement of that, and as I understand it, there's a, you know, an, a full uh, subcommittee of Cabinet, et cetera, that's about dealing with these. I, I'm just wondering what, what, what interventions does your department make when it's clear that these targets are failing with an individual agency? Sure, so I can answer that more fulsomely. The Premier's implementation unit is to do exactly that, is to go and look for more interventions, to think differently about it. If it requires budget supplementation, we will assist the, um, the cluster in doing that. Um, you're right, they are business as usual and we get on with them, pandemic or otherwise, and um, they've been like that for years. As I said before, if they were easy, they wouldn't be priorities, so they are very difficult. Some of them are going very, very well. Some of, some of the Premier's priorities are going very, very well. Hard yes, ones. I'm across those ones, but I'm particularly interested yeah. in the ones that really are not going so well. Yep, I understand, which is, what, which is why they're Premier's priorities and we're held to account for them, so you are spot on. Um, Premier's implementation unit works with each cluster, does it in a very collegiate fashion. There's no watchdog, there's no autocratic approach to it. It is very seamless. They do a lot of field work, so they get out and actually know how many homeless people are, are out there at any particular time. They do a lot of field work with um, Bump It Up for um, Aboriginal kids undertaking the HSC. And they do that across the domain. The ones that are really difficult, we continue to work with, um, particularly the Stronger Communities Cluster. Um, we will have to redouble our efforts in some of those um, if we are to achieve those targets. But they're, they're well known. COVID's um, impacted some of them for obvious reasons um, in terms of uh, some impact. But to be frank with you, there is always something happening in the world and we need to respond to them. Their targets, they have not moved in terms of the targets we have to reach. And we have to do better than we are right at the moment on some of them. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my so I suppose follow-up question to that is that, and these are the difficult ones, and I know that Ms Boyd asked about domestic violence and um, 
and, and a few others, but with everyone in lockdown, the concerns very much from child protection workers and from teachers and from health professionals is that there are very few eyes on kids who are in very challenging, probably neglect and suffering from neglect and abuse under lockdown. Um, but there's actually, you know, the reporting issues are very strong. I, I suppose that's a, look, that's a long way of me saying, are the Premier's priorities going to have to be reviewed given the impact of COVID? And I'm particularly thinking about the NAPLAN issues. I'm thinking about, um, the, you know, increasing rates of reoffending for domestic violence and obviously the increased reporting rates of um, vulnerable children. I mean, how is there a point in having a target that you're not going to meet? Are you going to have to review those? So the, the, the target will remain as it is at this point in time. The Premier will make up her mind about whether she wants to do anything. Culturally, holding onto the targets, no matter what's in front of us, um, has been a, a consistent approach since 2015 because it holds us to account. We push hard. You ask the difficult questions about um, what are you doing about achieving them, um, and that culturally has sort of uh, assisted us, I've found. At some stage, clearly the impacts of COVID, they are constantly monitored um, uh, in terms of uh, what's happening uh, with mental health, with um, what's happening in, in homes where there are less eyes. That very comment has been made by the Stronger Communities Cluster, so you're spot on. But the Premier will decide if she ever wants to uh, change a target and, and advise us. But in the interim, we just continue working with the cluster, looking for new ways of achieving things as best we can. And if something is going in the wrong direction, we try and put cure in on it. But um, there's two or three of them right at the moment that are difficult. We're held to account for them. They are not um, uh, going as well as they should. Not through the lack of effort from clusters, not through the lack of effort of um, putting resources towards it. People are working like you wouldn't believe in those areas of domain, but they are in very difficult circumstances. They are having to do a lot of digital um, uh, and online uh, catch up to, to deal with things that would have far better be dealt with um, out in community, as you'd be well aware. So it's, it's not easy, but um, at this point in time, to answer your question, targets are remaining the same. Do we revise as we go through COVID? Absolutely, we do about interventions. And um, there's no monopoly on good ideas, as I've said to you many times before. No, I'd also so we're into crossbench uh, time now, so I'll hand over to the crossbench. Oh, thanks, Chair. Mr Eden, we've just had the disturbing news that there are 633 new local cases of COVID-19 in New South Wales in the last 24 hours. When will everybody in New South Wales who wants to get a vaccine have ready access to a vaccine? At what date will people be able to get that protection from their government? So I can control what I can control. I'll say a few things. Um, vaccine supply is coming from the Commonwealth. Uh, the Commonwealth, I think, have made lots of comments about um, bringing forward as much supply as possible. We're doing that into New South Wales. We brought forth um, uh, for a whole range of uh, authorised and priority workers within southwestern Sydney, I think 100,000 over the last few weeks, and we're doing those right now. We've brought forth HSC students to get them back into... Um, uh, education within southwestern Sydney and western Sydney and uh, local government areas of concern. We've now just had another 530 uh, Pfizer land to again go into um, uh, priority areas. All that's going on while we continue to go on with the mass vaccination um, across the state. So at the current run rate, we are at 53% first dose. National Cabinet and the National Plan has advised on um, moving through certain phases, one at 70%, another one at 80%. On our current run rate, uh, we will get to 70 and 80% first dose um, in the fairly near future. We're going quite fast. You can track it daily as you see fit. We're going up about a percentage a day. Um, the second doses, um, uh, by their very nature, will follow uh, either three or six weeks um, uh, after that. So over the next few months, we will be at a very high vaccination rate and looking towards those 70 and 80% um, vaccination targets. Yep. Fair more Mr. micro pointed. Two more micro point about when can everyone actually book in to, to, um, uh, to get a, um, uh, a, a booking for a vaccination. The, the, the place has been in the last month or two swamped. Therefore, we are looking to get as many people through as we can. Some are not as quick as um, we would want, but with the supply we've had and the ramp up we are having right now, we, I'm confident we'll get through fairly quickly, Mr Shibridge. Mr. Reedon, when will there be enough supply to meet demand? 
when are those two curves going to intersect? You, you must have some visibility on this. When are you expecting those two curves to intersect? What date? Oh, uh, we, we do, but uh, to be frank, in the, the, the last few months, having more demand about two or three months ago than supply, yes, we want, we want to be a wash with supply without a doubt, but actually having a very strong demand was not a, a, a given just three months ago because there was so much uh, chatter about hesitancy, about who was going to take what type of vaccination. All those things are now set aside and the demand is very, very strong. We actually want the demand to stay very, very strong for the next couple of months for obvious reasons. The supply, um, I, I can't comment for everything the Commonwealth does, but they've given us extra doses for... Um, uh, we, we get a basically a allocation over several weeks in advance of Pfizer and AstraZeneca as base that goes through GPs, that goes through New South Wales Health. The 530,000 that we just received the other day is on top of that. So our supply issues are starting to be overcome. The Commonwealth have in indicated that even more supply will come in um, uh, September. So therefore, Mr. Reddam, my question was the date. When are you expecting there to be enough supply to meet demand? I don't know if there's a, a, a ready answer to that. If we had a perfect piece of paper in February this year and um, this was a far more orderly process at that point in time in terms of supply, um, at this point in time, Mr Shoebridge, operationally, we are simply vaccinating 600,000 people a week and we'll continue to do that. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a ready answer to that. I understand the nature of your question. If I was sitting there filling an empty train with people and how many customers to fill it, but we're right in the middle of it right now. Well, Mr Reardon, is the issue now um, the delivery, and this is why I'm asking you the question, is the issue now constraints in the capacity of the state to deliver vaccines, or is the issue now, is it the reason why people can't get a vaccine now because there's not enough supply coming from the federal system? It's a pretty oh, straight... Oh, 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 no, I understand. It's, 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 it's straight, it's straight, it's straight... It's straight, 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 straight service forward. delivery, and if you let me finish, that'll help Hansard. So I'll, I'll ask again, is, is the issue here a lack of supply or bottlenecks in the service delivery? What's what's preventing everybody in New South Wales from getting a vaccine right now if they want it? So capacities continue to increase, and uh, I don't know what maximum capacity that might be. All I know is how much supply comes along. So to try and answer your question, um, every dose we get now is basically going into an arm, without a doubt. So if you say that that's still um, a supply constraint, um, possibly, but we continue to get... The reason it's difficult to answer is we continue to go up every single week and we haven't gone backwards in it. So um, I, I can take on notice and give you some maps, but um, we just continue to increase and that's the positive thing. The best thing we can all do is go and encourage everyone to be vaccinated and let the New South Wales health and GPs, pharmacists and other sort of uh, clinics that are in reach get on with their business. Mr. Eden, moving to a different subject, um, on the... On the 1st of June 2017, Mr Chris Hanger, an Executive Director in the Department of Premier and Cabinet, um, wrote to Infrastructure New South Wales and said that following a request by the Premier, they were seeking a reassessment of a business case for the Australian Clay Target Association. Um, what role did the Premier have at that point um, in, in seeking or in the project and the, the assessment of the project? I really don't have detail. I wouldn't know what role the Premier had. But if I could hand this one to um, Ms Boyd, if that's okay, Ms Shoebridge. Sorry, Mr Shoebridge, can you repeat the last part? Well, on the 1st of June, a Deputy Secretary, a, um, a, an Executive Director from the Department of Premier and Cabinet said, wrote, wrote to Infrastructure New South Wales and said, following a request by the Premier... And they were seeking a reassessment of a business case for the Australian Clay Target Association. Um, how is it that the Premier um, had that role in seeking a um, reassessment? What, what, what was the Premier's role at that point? Well, look, I don't, I don't think it would be appropriate for us to comment on the substance of matters that are clearly currently under investigation by the ICAC. I, I believe this matter is one of them. So we would defer ask that you defer any questions on that. Well, Ms Boyd, I won't, um, so I'm going to ask again. Um, what was the Premier's role on the 1st of June 2017 in relation to the Australian Clay Target Association 
proposed grant for five and a half million dollars. Why was the Premier dipping her oar in at that point? Uh, I just refer to my previous answer. Well, Ms Boyd, um, that is not an answer. The fact that something is being investigated by ICAC, and I'm glad you're telling us that this has now been investigated by ICAC, um, does not prevent the Parliament from asking questions as well. And again, I ask you, what was the Premier's role on the 1st of June 2017 in relation to a $5.5 million grant of public money to the Australian Clay Target Association in Wagga Wagga? I'm looking in addition to the matters that I've raised, I'm actually not aware of what the Premier's role was in that, so we would have to take that on notice and consider an appropriate response. Mr Reardon, um, what, if any, um, documents were before the Premier at the time the Premier sought um, the, the, the assessment of the updated business case on the 1st of June 2017? What did the Premier have before her that motivated her to make that request? I wouldn't know and I'd have to take it on notice. Did the Premier at any point um, provide a statement indicating that there was a conflict of interest in relation to her role in this $5.5 million grant, given that the key proponent for this grant was Mr Darrell Maguire, and at the time the Premier had a close personal relationship with Mr Maguire. Was there a conflict of interest declaration made by the Premier, given her role? I wouldn't know, but I'm happy to, uh, if you've got any comment you want to make. No, I mean, I'll just repeat our previous answer that it's just not appropriate for us to preempt or undermine the ICAC's investigation. As you're aware, Operation Keppel is still underway and it just simply wouldn't be appropriate in this forum for us to, to give a response. Well, Mr Ridden, I press the question. The fact that I'm, and again, I'm glad that you've made it clear that ICAC is investigating this matter. I think that's important. But that does not stop Parliament from undertaking its role of scrutiny. And Mr Ridden, again, I ask you, did the Premier put a conflict of interest declaration on the record, um, given the fact that she was in a close personal relationship with Mr. Guire, with Mr. Maguire, who was the key proponent for this in the government? Was that on record? Can I'll you identify that? I'll repeat Ms. Boyd's response. Mr. Ridden, why is it so difficult to answer fairly straightforward questions about whether or not basic conflict of interest arrangements are in place? Um, and here we're talking about the handing out of five and a half million dollars of public money on a on a reheated business case um, in relation to a, a facility in Wagga Wagga. Why can't you just give us an answer on the record on this? Um, Mr. Shubhaj, I think these matters have been traversed um, with the Premier in public hearings before the ICAC. Um, and, and we won't go into those matters here. It would not be appropriate. Um, Ms Boyd, the Parliament has an obligation to oversight the expenditure of public money. In this case, the Premier personally intervened to get a reassessment of a business case for a $5.5 million grant to a facility in Wagga Wagga, um, the key proponent of which, in government, was a person with whom the Premier had a close personal interest. These are budget estimates hearings. And I think it's only right that you tell us whether or not a conflict of interest was ever declared by the Premier. This is not the Premier's money. It's not your money. It's the public money and we deserve answers. Look, I, I can't agree with the inferences that you've you've raised there. I'm not aware of the relevant facts, but if if you would like to ask the Premier whether she declared a conflict, I think that's a question for her. It would be appropriate for us to provide that answer here. I'm asking whether or not the records of the State of New South Wales, the records of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, contain any record of a conflict of interest. It's well within your capacity to answer that, Mr Reardon. Do the records of the Department of Premier and Cabinet contain any record of a conflict of interest? I don't know, but I, I'm happy to take anything on notice I can, but I would repeat what Ms Boyd said about um, you know, procedures underway elsewhere. Have you taken that on notice, Mr Reardon? If, if I can, I will. I'll take it on notice and then I'll take some advice on it. Mr Reardon, there's a very short amount of time, so I'll just ask you one simple question about the local government elections. 
has the Electoral Commission of New South Wales or the Commissioner of New South Wales sought additional funding to provide for postal votes for the local government elections? He, he may have, but uh, he's not knocked on my door to do so, but he, he may have. Ms Boyd? Yeah. Um, yes, we have received representations from the Electoral Commissioner just for shadowing that additional funding will be required um, given the postponement of the local government elections. And I understand that the Treasurer yesterday replied to those representations um, and you know, indicated that the government would obviously provide the funding that's required as a result of the postponement of the elections. And it is now the Electoral Commission to provide um, you know, more detail as to the actual funding required. And is there a willingness in government to provide whatever funding is needed, including if it's necessary in an emergency for an entirely postal um, um, vote for the local government elections? Is, is that a commitment that's been made by the government? Um, look, I think those questions would probably be better directed to the Electoral Commissioner himself um, and, and he can provide more detail on, on what has been conveyed to him in that regard. I see we've hit 11 yet, yeah, so I will hold my question. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Mr. Ridden and Ms. Boyd for your attendance at our hearing this morning. Uh, as you are now excused, but the committee secretary will be in touch with you to follow up on the questions that were taken on notice. Uh, thank you to the committee. We will now uh, return at 11.45. Um, just for everyone's info, the live stream continues. So if you don't want people to know what's going on in your lounge room, turn off your computers or screens or mute. Uh, but we'll see you at 11.45.
Hi everybody, welcome commissioners. We'll just be a minute while we let everyone back in. Hi everyone, we're just waiting on one of our witnesses before we kick off. Just see if we can chase up our missing witness. We just need to swear everyone in at once so we can't start until um, we have everybody. Okay, so we are just, uh, one of our witnesses is um, attempting to get in. We're just trying to make that happen. Uh, that's Mr. Hall. Uh, but in the meantime, what we might do is just begin swearing our other witnesses in. And then once um, we're able to sort the logistics for that out, uh, we will swear in uh, Mr. Hall. So I uh, will start uh, perhaps with Mr. Uh, Schmidt, if you would like to state your full name and position title and then swear either an oath or affirmation you should have that uh with you thank you and good uh, morning everyone uh john schmidt the new south wales electoral commissioner i solemnly sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth Thank you. Uh, hello, welcome, uh, Mr. Hall. I would invite you to please state your full name, uh, position, title, and then swear either an oath or affirmation, if you could. Yes, Peter Michael Hall, Chief Commissioner of the Independent Commission Against Corruption. I'll take an oath. I'll do it now. Yes, thank you. In the Bible, I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you, Mr. Reid. Um, Philip Reid, CEO of the Independent Commission Against Corruption. I'll affirm, I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Walden. Uh, Roy Alfred Walden, Solicitor to the Independent Commission Against Corruption. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. We'll start off our questions with the opposition. Oh. Thank you, Chair. How's that? Great. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you um, to all the commissioners and associated uh, personnel for your appearance today. I might just uh, direct these questions to the Chief Commissioner of the ICAC, if that's possible. Um, Chief Commissioner, can I just ask, how many uh, referrals uh, have you received from government agencies uh, in the past financial year? 
Um, Fred, I'll have to take that on notice. Uh, I don't have the figures readily to hand. OK, um, uh, look, on notice, are you also able to provide us with um, references you've received from the police as well? If you, want, if you can isolate that particular piece of information, that would be useful. And any other general statistics that you can would be most useful. Very well. We'll check our records how for many, that uh, and let you know. How many uh, investigation or how many referrals are still at the preliminary assessment stage? Um, I can't give you an exact number, but I think it's of the order of about eight or ten, perhaps Mr Reardon. I don't know whether he is able to assist on that one, but again, we would need to check our records, which are readily available. Thank you. Philip, um, and Philip how Reed long is it yeah. take? Yep, sure. Philip, Philip Reed here. Can we just clarify, that was referrals that are still being assessed, was it, that you were asking yeah. about? as distinct yes. to matters that have become our preliminary inquiries. So I think that's where... Yeah, well, let's break might... it down by stage. If we can get the information as to how many are being preliminarily assessed and how much have proceeded beyond that stage as mm -hmm. well. So to the end of 2020-21, um, we assessed 2,916 <clears throat> matters and um, we commenced um, 16 preliminary investigations and four Siru preliminary investigations and seven new full operations. But we'll get you those figures, but that gives you the figures to the end of 2020-21. Sure. Uh, thank you. That's very useful, Mr. Reid. Can I just ask you about some specific matters that have uh, been identified, in, I guess, to the Parliament uh, and in, in the public domain? I want to start with, firstly, with the government uh, or Transport for New South Wales's acquisition of uh, four to six Grand Avenue Camellia for the purposes of uh, the construction of a light rail stabling yard. Are you aware of that particular matter? Yes, <clears throat> I am. Uh, it has been referred to us. Uh -huh. It's not a matter that I think I should be discussing, however, uh, at this estimates committee, as it is a current sure. investigation. And, uh, I, of course, and, um, but I was just seeking whether or not um, you had seen the, the finding by the Auditor General. Yes, I read the finding. Audit. I, ha I have read the complete report of the Auditor General, yes. Yes. Are you able to provide us any information as to where that's up to in your assessment process, or are you not able to provide us that information? No, I'm not in a position to. I could, but I can't because of the secrecy provisions. Okay. Uh, it is, however, I can say that, uh, it, sorry, it is a matter that, as you know, um, <clears throat> has been referred to us. Uh, I have spoken to the Auditor General about the matter. Uh, we have had a meeting about it. Uh, we have a program that's um, in place for the matter to be progressed. I think beyond that, I'm really uh, not at liberty to disclose uh, as to where we are at precisely in the matter, but not 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 wanting to be difficult about it, but I think you understand my position. Oh, look, Chief Commissioner, I um I do, and I won't press you any further on that particular matter. Other than, uh, do you have a? And you don't need to tell me what this is if you do, but do you have a timetable or a uh, for when you feel like you would have completed your assessment of that matter, or can you provide us any guidance as to how much time you think it might take before you reach those decisions? <clears throat> Well, of course, we have our uh, KPIs uh, for uh, by which time various stages have to be achieved unless they have to be extended. Um, no, I'm not in a position to be able to say when our inquiries at this stage will be will, will reach the current st uh, conclusion of the present stage. Um, it's, a, it's a matter which um, uh, is uh, the subject of the Commission's attention and um, it, it's a matter about which, that is the time, it is a matter about which I'm not in a position to give you any specifics. Okay, thank you, Chief Commissioner. Just turning to another matter, um, at the last, well, in the February budget estimates hearings, uh, it was established that the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment had made a reference to ICAC about uh, 
planning processes affecting roads east. Are you, do you ever recall that particular matter? Sorry, affecting planning of what? Roads east. Planning matters affecting roads, roads. east. Sorry, is it roads, streets, did you say? Yes, roads. R yeah. R H O D E S. Yes. yes. Um, um, I am aware of a, a matter concerning uh, the roads area. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the same matter that you're interested in. Uh, well, it, it's to do with the planning process or the priority precinct process to do with roads east. Um, firstly, uh, from public hearings that ICAC has already held, I infer that you are looking at various matters to do with, I think, roads west or five dock, which is not too far from it, which might be, but this is a separate matter. Uh, it's to do with the involvement of a particular uh, developer and MP around the planning processes of roads east. Does this spark any recall? No, I don't. That's not enough information for me to be able to pinpoint it. We have a number of matters which come and go, which we assess. And um, uh, but uh, I think you know you, you are asking for details about current matters. Uh, I'm not in a position to provide in-house information as to various stages that we're at in different in, in different inquiries. <laughs> Uh, look, I, I appreciate, look, in future, I'm not going to push you if you feel like you aren't in a position to provide the information, but in terms of if you are able to provide any information about where that particular matter is in terms of the assessment process, given that firstly it has surfaced in Parliament, secondly it has surfaced in the public, and the third question, um, I'll ask you those two questions first before I ask you the third um, of that, because the third is more about policy than a particular matter. I'm sorry, is that a question? Yes, I'm asking, are you in a position to provide us with any information as to how long yes. it will take you to assess that particular matter? Uh, I'll take that on notice. We will have a look at our records and if we can provide you with any information, once we've properly identified the matter you're referring to, uh, we will provide yeah. it if we can. Is it your policy uh, to return a matter to the department or the or an agency that has referred it to you for them to undertake their own investigation into a matter? In some cases, we do that. It depends on the factual circumstances uh, of, a, of a matter. It may also depend on whether we're satisfied that the agency has the investigative capacity to do a, a proper investigation. But there's always a request to report back and provide us with the outcome of those investigations. And uh, what policies or procedures do you have in place to, for, to prevent a conflict of interest by that department affecting its investigation? Well, uh, we, we would examine whether or not, um, uh, for example, uh, any persons uh, being public officers of DPIE who may have had some involvement in decision making uh, or uh, any material involvement in a matter would be certainly a matter which would weigh heavily against referring it to the referral. Yes, we do have a policy that if there is an evident conflict of interests, we would not uh, leave the matter in the hands of the agency. I'm talking in very general terms, you understand. Sure, uh, but in a scenario in which the department itself feels like its staff may have been uh, subject to either a corruption risk or themselves have engaged in forms of corruption, uh, w w is it appropriate for them to be investigating their own staff and their own conduct? Well, it depends what the allegation is. But if, if it was an allegation of serious corruption, uh, then it would obviously not be appropriate for it to be left with the agency. We would be bound, duty bound, to take it on initially by way of assessment and then preliminary investigation and so on. Okay. Um, can I just turn, in respect to that policy of returning matters to an agency to investigate itself, have you done that in respect to referrals received about insurance care in New South Wales, otherwise known as ICARE? Um, <clears throat> not 
take that question off on notice, may or may not be able to provide you with information. Well, I'm not. If you also able to tell us how many ref references you have received or the ICAC has received about ICARE in the last three years? And what the outcome we, of each assessment was? Or We are in a position to provide uh, figures. Um, those matters have been, as it were, segmented and dealt with specifically over time. Um, <clears throat> I would be able to uh, have our files checked to see if we can provide you with the information you're after. Thank you. Uh, were, I just I, want to I, I ask you about were, some I, of the I evidence that... I'm sorry, I was just about to sure. say there were a, 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 quite a number of matters arising out of that um, a, 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 over that um, agency. Yes. There was, I agree with you. Um, uh, the, uh, but I just want to ask you about well, two specific ones and allow you to reply to effectively what ICARE has told the Parliament and hear your view of it to the extent to which you're able to. The first is in respect to a decision to award a contract to a staff, um, to a company secretly owned by a staff member of iCare and his son, for which, to be fair to iCare, they referred to you and the correspondence that's been tabled in Parliament shows that you returned the matter um, to them to investigate. And equally, well, firstly, uh, does, uh, are you, does that prompt your recall or are you aware of that matter? Uh, no, I don't. I don't recall the matter. So, Mookie, I, I don't want to um, cut across your line of questioning, but some of these questions are directed to specific matters uh, that the Commission is either currently dealing with or has recently uh, uh, reached a, a final stage or an interim stage on. I'm just simply not in a position, and I don't know whether an estimates hearing is the appropriate forum to be digging into the facts of particular cases, I have a reluctance to go there for, for the reason well, that I've I, will of course, I will, of course, respect the boundaries that you set, but in respect to this particular matter, uh, it has been completed, certainly according to, and which is what I was going to ask you, certainly according to ICARE and certainly according to the evidence that they've given to the Parliament, and equally according to them, the matter was completed in 2018. And I guess the response, uh, what I'd ask you to respond to, if you can, is not, not to provide any details about any particular investigation, but they have said publicly that having not heard from ICARE, ICAC, that they therefore infer that there is no corruption risk and no further action is warranted. Is that an appropriate statement for an agency to be making? I'm not going to comment on that. <clears throat> Fair enough. Um, in respect to the other, on the other ICARE matter, did you, were you asked to investigate circumstances in which the CEO of iCare awarded a contract to his wife. I'm not in a position to divulge that sort of information. Fair enough. Is that a particular matter that you referred back to iCare to investigate itself? Again, Mr. Mookie, it, um, the provisions of our Act, the Independent Commission Against Corruption Act, simply stand like a roaring lion in face of your questions, I'm afraid. I'm not at liberty to be imparting information on particular cases. Sure. Okay, uh, Mr. Chief Commissioner, have you ever, is a lack of resources ever a factor um, which may lead ICAC to return a matter to an agency to investigate itself? Yes, yes. It, it, it is frequently a matter we have to consider, take into account uh, along with a number of other matters as to whether we should handle the matter or whether we should not. And if we're not going to do with it, what's the appropriate course uh, to um, follow? But resources certainly is always and, an issue. Yes. And in respect to the sort of the 2000 odd matters that have been referred, uh, are you in a position to provide us any, uh, any information about how many of those matters have had to be returned to an agency to investigate itself due to a lack of resources? That might be difficult because, as I said, the reason we might refer it back to an agency is not, it, it could be a combination of reasons. Resources may be one, but it may not be the, the, the overriding reason we're sending it back to the agency. So I think it'd be difficult for us to get statistics uh, on those specific matters. 
Uh, we can give a certain amount of information about referrals, statistic information. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, well, I'm, look, I'm just picking up on what you said, Chief Commissioner. You, you said so that it's course. a frequent matter um, or it's a frequent reason. Are you able to expand yes. on that or provide any explanatory detail about that? Well, it, 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 it depends upon whether or not the matter is going to be resource intensive or whether it's not. It would depend upon what our capabilities are resource wise. I'm talking now about funding. <clears throat> uh, what, uh, how we can best use and deploy limited funding resources. Uh, obviously, a matter that is <clears throat> suggestive of, of serious corrupt conduct which is the area or systematic corrupt conduct, which are the areas that we are particularly required to deal with, <clears throat> those matters would be unlikely to be referred back. Uh, but uh, again, uh, we would need to determine how best to handle it from a resource point of view so that we don't um, uh, disrupt the timetable and program for other matters. It's a balancing act. Um, and as I've said before, uh, resources uh, is an issue we do consider. It may be a problem, it may not be, depending upon how much funding we've got available at any given time. Um, the, um, uh, the, um, the seriousness of the matter or, the, or if the matter is not regarded as serious, whether it's a low grade matter, these are all, all go into the mix in deciding case by case whether we refer it or whether we don't. Chief Commissioner, are you currently facing resource constraints? There's always resource constraints, always. And is the order of magnitude of those constraints greater or lesser than usual? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Is the order of magnitude of your current resource constraints greater or lesser than usual? Well, I can say it's probably lesser than usual at the moment. That's largely due to the COVID impact on our capacity to operate in the normal way. So hence we're not consuming and using our <coughs> financial resources at the same rate to the same extent as in normal times. That doesn't mean that we're not active. We are active, uh, but um, not to the same level as normal. And have you made any requests for any supplemental resourcing in the last 12 months? In the last 12 months? <clears throat> Mr. Reid well, might actually, have a better recollection. Ask, have you made any recent requests for supplemental resourcing? Not that I can think of. And ahead I, of this particular... I can, uh, I can answer that question. We sought through the budget process for 21-22, 8 million from the government as additional appropriation funding. And we received 5.6 million from the government as additional appropriation funding. Um, and that is what we're operating on at this point. Um, last financial year, we saw 4.9 million and we received in two chunks that 4.9 million during the course of the year, which has meant that we haven't sought supplementary funding in the last financial year. Um, and we're at the beginning of this financial year. So what were the reasons, that, were you provided reasons why the full $8 million uh, wasn't granted? That's to Mr. Reid, I guess, I presume, as a follow um, No. It's a short answer. And did you have that interaction with the Treasury or with the Premier and Cabinet? Um, well, we submit our bids, um, the so called parameter and technical adjustments, through Treasury, um, and we get advice back from Treasury. Um, we may then get correspondence from the Department of Premier and Cabinet as to the outcome, but we find out directly from Treasury um, what is actually going to be put into the 
budget for any one financial year and the forward estimates as well after it's gone through the expenditure review committee process, et cetera. Right. Have so you we want to come back to this line of questions. Sorry, it's crossbench uh, time. So uh, crossbench, who um, we, should reach? Thanks, Jeff. Um, thank you all for your attendance and your work throughout the year. It's, it's much appreciated by all of us. Um, is it, whilst we're on the question of funding, it might be useful to ask you, um, Mr. Hall, um, Mr. Schmidt, about the joint letter that was sent um, between the three agencies, I think on the 15th of July this year to the government um, concerning, um, I suppose the description is the negotiations about an independent funding model. Um, Mr. Hall, did, did you want, could you give us any context for that letter? And uh, Mr. Schmidt, if you might follow up. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Shoebridge. Um... I could go on at some length, but I'll try and keep it as tight as I can. Um, <clears throat> the position has been made clear that <clears throat> uh, funding under the present arrangements <clears throat> is not only not satisfactory or appropriate, but it is not in accordance uh, with law. and. Um, though, extraordinarily enough, the executive government has been involved in determining the funding of the Commission for close to over 30 years now, it was not until last year that it was identified that there is a serious question as to the legality of the executive government uh, uh, being involved in the processes that lead to the funding decisions by Parliament, and the appropriation, and in relation to supplementary funding. That legal position has been <clears throat> unchallenged. Um, it is to be taken uh, as the correct statement of the law, and that is to say <clears throat> that the funding of the Commission should be done and is the responsibility of the Parliament. <clears throat> That um, position has been consolidated by the Auditor General's report given later in October of last year, which has highlighted the problems associated with it, and in particular the risks <coughs> posed to the independence of the Commission. <coughs> and I could elaborate in many in the way in which those risks <coughs> have come home over time and do it impact on the Commission's capacity. <clears throat> it is a serious public interest issue. The um, government said that they would consider the Auditor General's report <clears throat> along with the, I guess, the PAC report uh, <clears throat> in determining its uh, response. And to that end, we were advised that uh, Minister Harwin um, was conducting a review. <clears throat> that review, as we understand it, and as we don't have much information about it, <clears throat> has been ongoing now for uh, some time. And um, Mr. Um, Walden and Mr. <clears throat> Reid have met on a couple of occasions with ministerial advisors to determine the parameters of this review and where it's going and how we can assist in it. Um, it was of some concern to to us that this whole review, this issue that has been thrown up by the Walker opinion and the Auditor General's report, be conducted on a basis that does recognise not only that the Parliament has a role, but it is responsible for what Mr Walker de determined in planning and implementing a parliamentary solution. We are concerned as to whether that is going to come to pass. We were not encouraged <clears throat> by the me two meetings we've had with ministerial advisers that that was a matter in focus in, this, in the course of this review. Uh, the Commission has its particular
particular concerns over that matter. Um, it wants to ensure that the review does proceed along a pathway that does indeed <clears throat> lead to a new approach to funding, but one in which the parliament and not the executive plays <clears throat> the role in funding the commission. And we have some issues in common with our brother or sister independent agencies, in particular the one Mr Schmidt is here today representing, because the issues we saw did constitute common ground between the agencies and that we ought to make it known uh, to government that we share a concern to ensure that any review of the current arrangements is in accordance with principle and will serve the public interest of the independent agencies. <clears throat> it is important, I think, to emphasise that the funding of the Commission, from our point of view, is a matter that has to be ultimately one in which the parliament is centrally involved in the processes that lead both to preparation, remuneration or, or appropriation resources, uh, as well as supplementary as necessary, given the ability of the work we do. The, there has not been recognition I think over the last 30 years, about one reason why funding has in this, gone off the rails for the ICAC. And that is that we are, and the other independent agencies are, and can be termed parliamentary agencies. That phrase is not often used. In fact, it's never used. But it has been used to emphasise the independent status of these bodies and the role the parliament plays uh, in them. So um, it's a long way of saying that Shoebridge, that it is absolutely critical that any review of the current system of funding does not produce an outcome whereby the form or some changes are made to it, but the reality is that the principles I've been referring to are not given effect. We have to discuss with the um, with with the government and and the premier in particular, and the premier has uh, thankfully agreed uh, to meet this joint uh, meet with the uh, agency jointly, so that this matter can be discussed. We don't want to be in a position whereby outcomes are decided without us being able to understand the direction it's taking. Um, thanks, Mr. Hall, and I, and I, do, I really do appreciate that um, detailed consideration, um, given given the lengthy history. And it may come as no surprise to you that, as the chair of the Public Accountability Committee, um, I would be very, very keen to see this reach a conclusion sooner rather than later, which put parliamentary sovereignty over executive sovereignty. Mr. Schmidt, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Schubert. If I could just add a couple of comments, um, my views have been made plain before various parliamentary committees that the current funding arrangements are not fit for purpose. And having gone through the most recent budget round of bids, um, where we had mixed but ultimately um, serious um, a lack of success in important matters, um, I believe this is a matter we've, uh, which must be resolved. We've got your committee's report, we've got the Auditor General, um, as for the approach to the Premier about the meeting, obviously time was in the uh, correspondence minds with the, the date for the response to be tabled. I'd had some um, preliminary com uh, conversations with both the Premier's and Mr Harwin's office. 
Uh, but I think the general feeling between the agencies, if I'm speaking on my own behalf here, was that it would be good to have a chance to put our views directly to the Premier, uh, because it would be far better to try and canvas and clarify issues directly from us prior to the government going out and uh, nailing its colours to the mast, as it were, and need to have us um, come back with serious misgivings. So um, uh, here's hoping that um, that meeting proves to be the start of a constructive dialogue. And is there a date for that meeting? I, I know, as I understand it, the deadline for a response has now been moved to the 29th of October of this year. But is, is there, has that date been set for the meeting with the Premier? I could answer that. Uh, yes, we have an appointment to see the Premier on the 21st of September next. Um, and. Uh, that um, hopefully will be timely enough to ensure that we have been adequately heard and these, the representations we make <clears throat> are given serious consideration. Could I just add one matter, that, and that is this, that <clears throat> so far as the funding of the Independent Commission is concerned, speaking now of the Commission, it is plain that the designation that I referred to earlier as parliamentary agency, that we are a parliamentary agency, that designation appears uh, in the, the WI Bank Royal Commission report. It was written by Sir Ronald Wilson, who was a highly esteemed judge for many years of the High Court of Australia. And um, Justice Wilson, uh, high, uh, sorry, Justice uh, uh, Kennedy, who was a high, <clears throat> highly regarded member of the Supreme Court of Western Australia, it was their words that that designation, that an anti-corruption commission they were addressing, is a parliamentary committee in the sense, three important senses. Firstly, in appointments to the Anti-Corruption Commission. Secondly, and I use their words in quote, <clears throat> in their funding. And thirdly, Parliament receiving their reports and recommendations. <clears throat> so that the Commission was established by the Parliament. The Commission is responsible, is accountable to the Parliament. The Commission is obliged to provide its reports to the Parliament and it is the Parliament that has the power under the Act <clears throat> to fund the Commission, which it does. <clears throat> the Parliament should not be shouldered out of the way <clears throat> of the processes that lead to proper funding of this Commission in the public interest, the public interest being the paramount consideration as the act, terms of the Act reflect, <clears throat> the Parliament has to be right in front and centre of any review, whether it commences by way of a joint parliamentary <clears throat> committee, whatever, however it's done, it has to be done. So they are aspects that I think need to be considered in the course of this review, not only as to what should be done, but how it should be done. And that is my concern, <clears throat> that we do not end up in a situation in forbidden another 30 years time and somebody else says they identified the problem back in 2020, 2021. They thought they fixed it, but they didn't. We're still here with an independent commission meant to be protecting the public interest. However, that is still subject to control and influence from the executive government, something the founder of the Commission in the Parliament, Mr Griner, said should not, cannot happen. So that's why this matter has risen to a, a higher level by way of a joint representation to, to ensure this matter stays on course and is dealt with properly in the public interest. Um. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hall. It's, it's hard to see how you can have genuine statutory independence if that is if you are subject to financial strictures from those you're oversighting. Um, um, 
that that's a that's a, a subject for a, a, a much a much longer discussion point. Um, could you provide to the committee the correspondence that you sent? Yes, that, that will be done. Thanks very much. The um, uh, Mr. Schmidt, we we heard from Mr. Reardon that um, you had some good news yesterday from the treasurer that a funding request that you had made um, in relation to local government election had been agreed to. Can can you shed any light on that? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Shoebridge. Um, I know you specifically referenced postal voting. If you'd bear with me for one minute, I, I just want to get it on the record. And this is not meant to be a criticism of government or, or councils or any uh, parties or independents um, in the parliament, because I know a range of views have been expressed on this issue. In July last year, I wrote to the government recommending that the local government elections be held in a fully postal fashion supported by internet voting to a limited extent if it could be um, arranged in time. Uh, the decision was taken to continue with the arrangements um, in the legislation as they are now with in-person voting supplemented by postal and internet voting. Part of the reason I asked for that was because, and this goes back to some of my perennial problems, um, the nature of my election systems mean that I cannot rapidly pivot from one form of election to another. So a significant period of time is required. If I was going to move from a, a mixed channel uh, local government election to full postal, uh, I estimated at that time it would take 12 months, so the elections were postponed for 12 months. A full postal election also requires significant logistical engagement with the providers of the service, the printers, the um, fulfilment, which means putting the postal packs together and sending them out. Um, there are limited providers in Australia who do that. And so um, existing contracts would have to be renegotiated. Another element, of course, with postal voting, if we move to full postal voting, the legislation has to change. Um, and it is open to any member of parliament to bring a bill forward. Uh, to introduce full postal voting. I'll, I won't pursue that any further. Uh, but in the absence of a legislative change, I am required to offer in-person voting. The elections will fail unless I do so. Um, and as part of that, I will continue to provide postal and internet voting. It is too late now to move in December um, to a full postal vote. It, it just can't be done in that time. I also, with my current ageing electoral systems, which I receive no money for in the budget um, to uh, correct uh, ongoing problems, I cannot run simultaneously a full postal yes. election in some councils and mixed channel elections in others. Our system cannot cope with that and would potentially fall over. I cannot run state by-elections while I'm running a full local government elections because my systems cannot maintain that and would potentially fall over. Uh, so there is a risk, of course, with COVID uh, that there may be further issues with the December local government elections. Um, I am looking at alternative scenarios um, which would potentially push into next year. Of course, now we run into the problem that we are preparing for the state general election with my aging systems, which cannot rapidly shift from one to the other, uh, with a limited number of subject matter experts who I cannot convert it to ongoing employment because I cannot get funding to convert them to ongoing employment. Uh, so um, I will work to look for options for reform, um, but the government has given me comfort in a letter uh, that additional money uh, required to make preparations for the local government elections will be made available. And of course, I'll have to provide details in due course of what that might look like, um, but I can proceed on that basis. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavour of the challenges that I'm I'm dealing with at the moment. Well, Mr. Schmidt, that sounds, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a polite adjective to attach to it, troubling is the, um, is the summary I would take from that. Does, does that mean that if we have a fresh, well, if, if the, sorry, maybe we'll go back to first principles. Do you, have you been able to get some clear public health advice about whether or not it's likely to be safe to have people attending polling booths um, across New South Wales in the first week of December? Have we got, have you got written public health advice that assists you with that? 
We, we have a working party with health um, and other agencies, education and police, et cetera, are represented on that. Um, I haven't asked for written advice um, as to a projection, as it were, um, at the first week in December or the, the week, two weeks leading up to that because of early voting. Um, I, uh, in light of the current fluid nature of the discussion, um, I'm not sure what advice health would be able to give me. But the point, the ultimate point is regardless, um, I have to, if I'm providing elections, I must do it within the confines of the legislation as it currently is. Um, it would be good if there were some of the COVID specific provisions which were in various bits of legislation, uh, which have now lapsed, which allow um, flexibility about extending times, uh, changing approaches to the extent that they can be accommodated. Um, but again, um, there's no legislation currently before the parliament. Oh, the, I think there might be a bill in the lower house uh, which came down from the Legislative Council just before uh, the recess, which has some of those elements in it. And which the government has refused we'll to this. Uh, it's the uh, opposition time uh, for seven minutes. Oh, sorry, Penny, we can't hear you. There you go. Sorry. Or was that unmuted person? Sorry. <laughs> um, <coughs> Mr. Schmidt, thanks very much for coming in. Obviously, um, really significant issues that you've just outlined in relation to the constraints that you're trying to run a, a statewide local government election. Can I just ask you sir, a couple of um, a couple of issues. The first one is um, obviously we, we have an indication that you've had a letter from Treasury saying that yes, we'll provide the money. Um, I assume there's no quantum for that. Not as yet, no. But but I also assume that you've made previous requests in relation to the cost of postal voting and the cost of I voting. Are you able to provide us some information about that? We made requests. Uh, sorry, for clarification, are you asking costs if we move to a full postal slash I vote election? Yes, and, and the, obviously there's the big cyber, we haven't even touched the cyber security issues, um, which we may get to in my seven minutes. But I mean, really, I'm just, you know, it, these issues are not new. You've indicated that you've you know written to the government previously about it, but it sounds to me that you're still at, you know, step one um, in terms of, yes, we'll give you some money. How much do you want? I'm asking you, what do you need and what have you asked for specifically in relation to postal voting and I voting? When I made my recommendation in July last year about a full postal slash I vote election, I predicted, and I can't think of the exact figures, that there would have been significant savings, some tens of millions of savings, if we didn't have um, in person voting. Um, on top of that, of course, since uh, the pandemic, has um, expanded. We've received we've received all the money that we have asked for for the local government elections. We received an extra thirty seven million dollars for COVID uh, safety measures, and as we've discussed just a moment ago, I'll be going back seeking an additional uh, amount of money, uh, which will be I suspect some tens of millions of dollars to um, aim for uh, using the current channels for voting on the begin in the beginning of December. And do you ex so that so just to be clear that would that Without legislative change, it's postal votes plus I votes plus um, in person. That's correct. Right, because um, of course one of the issues, if it was to be any changes, is the parliament's not currently sitting, which makes passing legislation fairly difficult. But uh, sorry, uh, it just if I could clarify, even if legislation was passed now and parliament resumes in September, it's too late to right. shift my systems from the current configuration to a full postal. Yep, sorry. And so how long would it take you? I mean, I'm sorry if you've answered this before, but how long would it take you to, to move to full postal? We predicted it would take approximately 12 months when we gave advice in July last year. Um, it, we, I believe it could be done in a shorter time frame, but I don't know what that is as yet. But also, it may well be just purely logistically with the system capacity and the uh, ability of service providers uh, to do the fulfilment for the postal um, packs going out, et cetera. Even then, we might have to split the election into tranches uh, to cover the entire state, uh, which is obviously eating into more time in, in the coming calendar year. 
at the same time as gearing up for the state general election. Uh, so there are a number of challenges inherent in that um, proposal. Yes, extremely challenging. So, and can I just clarify that if, if the um, elections are to be delayed, if they had to be, I mean, based on what you've just said there, there's no way you could run them all on December 4. Again, that requires a change to the law, doesn't it? My understanding is that if these elections, and, and I'm not giving you legal advice. I, no, uh, no, no, I'm not asking that, but I just think yes. you'd, you'd have a pretty, you'd probably have the best idea of anyone here. Well, my belief is that if, if these elections were to fail in the sense in which that use, word is used for the local government legislation, it then falls to the returning officers to set the new dates. Uh, and there's a time frame. It might be three months within which um, the new date would have to be set. So you'd, it would be a very challenging process um, because you'd have to then, have, one would assume there could be f further failures. So you'd have a rolling uh, sequence of um, events and delivering elections in, in those circumstances would, would have its own challenges. So given all of those things, which can I just say are very troubling, um, what do you advise needs to be done to ensure that we can have elections for local government? Uh, I, I, at this stage, I'd prefer to keep my own counsel because I'm still considering the options and meeting with the um, Office of Local Government uh, senior officials there to talk about options. So um, I, I would beg your indulgence on that for the moment. It's all right. I won't press you too. I, I just, I mean, it, it just is clearly there's no, there's no good options here. It's all very difficult. So I just, I, I accept that. Um, can I just ask you, um, in terms of the redistribution um, for state, um, for state electorates, my understanding is that that's due any time now. Can you give us the time frame for that, please? Yes, it's scheduled. Sorry, the determination is scheduled to be given to the governor on Friday, uh, and then it, it's out of our the panel's hands, um, and it's a matter to go through the process of gazettal, etc. Right. And can I just confirm also that there's in terms of um, oh no, this is sorry, that's the wrong question. Um, I can't read my own handwriting. Um, my final question, I think I'm almost out of time, but my um, final question really is, um, uh, will you be able to just take on notice, I suppose, how much you think it will cost um, and, and what you've previously asked for in relation to, to dealing with the, the full postal ballot? I'll, I'll give to the, to the best that I can, I will. That's my end of my questions. Thank you, Mr Schmidt. Thanks, uh, the crossbench. Mr. Shivridge. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, Commissioner Schmidt, I, I think there's probably a few more questions about the local government elections. Um, you're caught in a, an almost impossible situation, aren't you? If the legislation requires you to have polling booths open for a particular date, um, that, that doesn't have any allowance for taking into account the public health orders um, and, and the, the nature of the, the, the pandemic at that time. Can you talk us through that that problematic conflict? And just in more context, uh, one of the one of the issues which um, uh, influenced me in in seeking the deferral, the three months deferral, as it is, is the basic issue of getting uh, the temporary workforce in we need. Uh, so we're ha we're having additional polling places to enable there to be social distancing, and that's good. Um, but it doesn't work if, of course. Uh, through fear, um, uh, people decide not to take up that employment opportunity for for that period. Um, uh, sorry, I've, I've lost my train of thought with the rest of your question. Well, it was the fact that the, the Local Government Act, um, which I think is the primary act that deals with the elections for local government um, councillors, doesn't have any reference to the Public Health Act and the public health orders. and. Um, even if there is a pandemic crisis, you may be statutorily compelled to open up polling booths and allow people to come out in public and vote, even if the public health advice says that's a very bad idea. There are provisions in the local government regulation about uh, a polling place failing to open, and that includes um, health concerns as well. So what, what would happen is if a polling place fails to open, 
then uh, if it's an award, the election for that ward is held over. I forget the period of time. And similarly, if it's an undivided council, the um, the uh, the uh, election is held over again. Um, I suspect if you didn't reopen within the statutory or the, the regulatory time frame, that the election would consider to have failed and would have to be held again. Um, but in the absence of that, um, we have to offer in-person voting. And encouraging people on one level to come out to vote when all of the public health messaging is stay at home, that, that must be almost impossible for you to, to try to um, resolve that conflict. It's a difficulty and also we can't, of course, even though the, the, the categories for postal vote have been widened, I, I think that now includes a, an apprehension of, of COVID risk, but we can't at this late stage push everybody in to that stream because logistically there um, we would have failures. Internet voting is only being arranged for a certain capacity. We can't, um, and people have, you know, some people are more comfortable with postal, some people are more comfortable with, with in-person voting. Uh, th these, these are challenges uh, which we face. Commissioner, you've, you first alerted the government to these very real concerns in July of last year by correspondence. Could you provide the committee with that correspondence? Yes. If, if the parliament was to return, um, let's say in the first week or so of September, and make an emergency provision for a postal vote and to, to allow you to undertake a statewide postal vote for local councils and then provide a timing um, that, that would allow that to actually happen. Can you give an indication about what sort of time frame you would need, what sort of envelope you would need to, to have that workable? I, I would have to come back with that information and I could come back to the parliament um, in, if such legislation came forward. For it to, to work, the parliament would really, and, and this is not my role, but I'll just make it, if I was drafting, it really has to give the minister for local government, I think, uh, the authority to make uh, some determinations about dates and channels and are fairly open, um, obviously COVID emergency, COVID limited, and that decision would be in consultation with myself and we would have to uh, uh, work out an appropriate time frame. <laughs> I think I'll try and work my way through to get a time frame out of that, Commissioner, but um, do I understand at the moment that if if the COVID-19 situation continues um, and there continue to be real restrictions on the ability and willingness of people to come out to polling booths, that there's a real likelihood that the December local council elections could fail in all or part of the state. If, if people are unwilling, if, we, if I'm unable to open polling places, then elections could fail. If people are unwilling to turn out, um, there's no minimum requirement for the number of people to vote at a particular election, but whether um, the Court of Disputed Returns, in which case, in this case, I think it's the Land and Environment Court, um, whether that would be a legitimate election would be a matter for others to consider. But um, obviously, um, participation is something which we, you know, we, we're here to promote democracy. We want people to participate. So, so one of the potential outcomes is we have a local council election in December where we have a minority of voters to attend and then a, a, a world of political and legal uncertainty that flows from that. That's that must keep scenario. you awake at night, Commissioner. I have a number of things that keep me awake at night. It, can I just be clear? Is it, is it your best advice that the thing to do would be to empower an emergency a postal vote if needed and have a legislative framework and the resourcing necessary so that that can be implemented if that's the only safe way of holding a local council election? I think that would be a sensible fallback to have in place to such an eventuality, um, yes. Do you have any indication of what kind of additional funding would be required to enable that to be delivered through the electric, through your commission? There's two elements to that. One, 
I'm not saying it would save money, but it, it because of sunk costs to date with running um, the preparations, which are sunk costs for for the deferred and and postponed elections to date. Uh, but the the cost of running a full postal um, is not as great as an attendance vote. So, um, yeah, that that may be something. But my bigger concern then begins to swing towards what capacity I need to build up and almost a shadow operation within the commission uh, to ensure that I can continue um, necessary preparations for the state general election at the same time. So uh, there are a few factors at play there. Uh, so that concludes uh, crossbench time. Do the government members have any questions? Oh. Uh, in no, which case, fine. yeah, thanks. Um, so can I thank you all for your attendance? Thank you, Chief Commissioner Hall, Commissioner Schmidt. Uh, thank you to Mr. Reader and Mr. Walden uh, for attending and participating today. We do appreciate it. Uh, the committee secretariat will be in touch with you about the details of any questions that were taken on notice and the arrangements for providing the information to the committee. Uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you uh, for the work that you do. Um, and I think that concludes uh, the hearing for this morning. So first Thank you one, very much. Thank you very much. Done successfully. Thanks, guys. See you all soon.